The Appellate Division First Department is now in session. Good morning and welcome to our virtual oral argument. Today, there are two items of business to address before I call the calendar. First, and on a very somber note, we all remember that today is September 11th, now the 19th anniversary of the horrific terrorist attacks on our beloved city, and other parts of our country. On that one day, we lost so many members of the New York City Fire Department, the NYPD, and thousands of innocent people who were just going about their daily activities like any other day. The court system also lost three of our very finest court officers. And in the years that have followed, we have continued to lose family, friends, and colleagues first responders, police officers, firefighters, and people who just happen to live or work at or near ground zero and have developed and continue to develop and suffer from numerous forms of cancer and other 9-11 related illnesses. Our lives have never been the same, but our city and our people have come back stronger and more resilient, looking positively towards the future just as I hope we will be able to do again when this terrible pandemic is over. I would ask that everyone please observe a moment of silence for the many lives that were lost on 9-11 and its aftermath. Thank you very much. And now on a much happier note, it is the tradition of this court that the justice presiding on a panel makes some welcoming remarks when a new justice sits on the bench of the Appellate Division First Department for the very first time. This summer, as many of you know, so have Gov you not been Governor Cuomo appointed four new justices to our court. And every day this week, we have had the honor of welcoming one of the new justices. Normally, of course, we would be in our beautiful courthouse on Madison Avenue, and the courtroom would be filled with all the judicial and non-judicial members of our court family. Today, we have to do this virtually, but I hope that this will not take away from the excitement of the moment. I am very pleased and honored to be able to officially welcome the Honorable Sally Ann Scarpula to her very first sitting as a Justice of the Appellate Division First Department. It is particularly appropriate that this honor would fall to me as our judicial careers have always been very intertwined. The very first day that I sat on the Appellate Division First Department, the justice presiding was the Honorable Carla Moskowitz, now retired. When she introduced me, she mentioned that when she got elected to Supreme Court New York County, it created a vacancy in the civil court, and I received the nomination to take over her civil court seat. When 10 years later, I was nominated to the Supreme Court in New York County, that same vacancy in the civil court was created and Justice Scarpula received the nomination to take over that uh, civil court seat, which began her judicial career. Very good genes in that civil court seat. When I was appointed to the appellate division in January 2014, Justice Scarpula was appointed to take over my commercial division part in Supreme Court, New York County. And now here she is as my colleague on the appellate division first department. Justice Scarpula is a graduate of Boston University where I attended law school and she graduated from Brooklyn Law School cum laude. After law school, Justice Scarpula clerked for the Honorable Alvin Klein, the father of our friend and colleague, the Honorable Sherry Klein Heitler. 
When her clerkship concluded, Justice Scarpula jo joined the law firm of Proskauer Rose Getson Mendelssohn as a litigation associate and then moved to the FDIC and Hudson United Bank. Justice Scarpula returned to the New York State court system in 1999 as principal court attorney to the Honorable Eileen Branston, yet another one of our commercial division colleagues, after which she began her judicial career. Justice Scarpula is a contributing author to the commercial litigation in New York State Courts treatise and has offered several articles on technology, which I know is one of her many areas of expertise, and commercial litigation. She is also a frequent lecturer for many bar associations. Justice Scarpula is active in several New York City and statewide bar associations and is a business court representative to the American Bar Association. She is a member of New York's Commercial Division Advisory Council, as am I, and she serves as co-chair of the council's subcommittee on use of technology in commercial division cases. Justice Scar uh, Scarpula also sits on the Chief Judge's Alternative Dispute Resolution Advisory Committee and was appointed in October 2019 by the Chief Judge to the New York State Continuing Legal, Legal Education Board. Justice Scarpula is a board member and the judicial co-president of JALPCA, the Judges and Lawyers Breast Cancer Alert, which just held its very first and very successful virtual gala Tuesday evening. And just to close the circle, Justice Scarpula followed my longtime law clerk and now another very successful judge, Honorable Michael Katz, in that position. So you see we're very connected in our lives and judicial careers. I know Sally Ann will be a great addition to our court, and we are all thrilled to have her with us. For those of you who are able, I would ask you to please join me in a warm round of applause to welcome Justice Scarpula to the Appellate Division First Department. Thank you very, very much. I You're would like to just say that I am so fortunate that Barbara Kapnick was put in my life <laughs> I, uh, I'm grateful for that, and I'm grateful uh, to be sitting here. I'm very excited to be on the on the first department, and and very excited to have my first sitting with not only Judge Kapnick but Judge Gonzalez and Judge Gesmer, two people who I admire so much. So all good. Thank you. <laughs> well, welcome. Okay, and now we're ready to call the calendar. Um, the first case uh, on today's calendar, People versus Latour Irvin. Is the appellant here? Yes, Your Honor. Arielle Reed representing appellant Latour Irvin. Okay, you have six minutes for argument and two minutes for rebuttal. Is the uh, respondent here? Ms. Deborah Morse? Okay, we'll, we'll have to recall that case in a little while, Ms. Reed. Um, let me just mark that. The second case, Stickney versus Akar, that case is submitted. C. Tylea versus Carl S., submitted. Pizzarati versus FPG Maiden Lane, submitted. People versus Tajamal Sharif Brown is the appellant here. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, you have seven minutes and two for rebuttal, although that might uh, have to get a little shortened. We'll see as we go on. Is the respondent here? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, you have seven minutes also. Uh, People versus David Garcia, that case is submitted. Jarmuth versus Leonard, that case is submitted. Shianogi versus Andrix Labs is the appellant here. Uh, yes, Ed Flanders. Uh, Mr. Flanders, you have eight minutes for argument and two minutes for rebuttal. Uh, is the respondent here? Yes, Your Honor. This is Lene Cipriano for respondent. I also have with me a colleague, David Zimmer, and with permission of the court, I ask that he be permitted to participate in the appeal. Mr. Zimmer, are you here? Uh, I am, Your Honor. Okay, great. Thank you. You will have 10 minutes to argue. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Uh, People versus Williams, that case is submitted. People versus Banyan, is the appellant here? 
Uh, yes, Your Honor. Joshua Luke Rushing for the appellant, Jonathan Banyan. Okay, you have six minutes for argument and two for rebuttal. Uh, is the respondent, thank you, uh, is the respondent available? Mr. Cohn, we can't hear you. Okay, well, um, I think you're here and you might be having trouble with your with your uh, audio, but you have eight minutes for argument. Hopefully you'll be able to get it all set up by the time we get to you. Okay, thank you. Um, the next case is um, uh, S. Children, uh, just the respondent, Josephina S. has requested time. Um, Miss Llewellyn, are you here? Miss Llewellyn, uh, you're not muted. You're un you have to unmute. Okay, well, she was here before, so we'll have to we'll have to recall that case. Sorry, Your Honor, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, you have five minutes to argue. Um, um, nobody else is arguing in that case. Thank you. Epi versus Heracles Farms is the uh, appellant here. Yes, Your Honor, Ty Gooley. Okay, you, you have five minutes to argue and uh, the respondent? Yes, this is Marwan Sahuel for the respondent. Okay, and you also have five minutes to argue. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Castro versus Jakob Bashvili. That case is submitted. People versus Antoine Chambliss. That case is submitted. People versus Ruddy Arnote. Yes, Your Honor, for the appellant. Okay, you have six minutes and two minutes um, in rebuttal. And is the respondent here? Yes, good morning. Victoria Mead for the people. Okay, and you have eight minutes. Um, eight. You're welcome. Uh, Freed versus Amberg is the appellant here. Yes, Your Honor, Shai Silverman. Okay, you have six minutes and one minute in rebuttal. And respondent? John Morkin uh, for Amy Freed and her sisters, Gail Freed and Cynthia Amberg. Okay, and you have seven minutes to argue. Um, people versus Kyle Collier. Good morning, Your Honors. Benjamin Weiner for the appellant. Okay, Mr. Weiner, you have six minutes and one minute in rebuttal. And respondent? Good morning, Your Honor. Diana Wang for the people. Uh, good morning. And you have six minutes um, to argue. The last case, Grant versus United Odd Fellow, that case is submitted. Now, uh, the first case that's supposed to be on for argument. Um, People versus Irvin. The respondent still is not here, Miss Morse. Okay, well, we're gonna have to we're going to have to call that case uh, later. Um, so, uh, Miss Reed, you'll have to hold hold on a little bit, and the court will see if they can find. Maybe you can help that too. So, we're going to start with the case People versus Tajamal Sharif. Brown. I believe Ms. Schriefler, you are available. Schriefter. Yes, thank you. Okay. So you, may, you may begin, yes, for sure. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honors. My name is Emma Schriefter from the Office of the Appellate Defender on behalf of Mr. Tajamal Brown. The communications between Mr. Brown and his co-defendant, Mr. Walker, must be suppressed because the court did not have the authority to issue warrant to intercept communications made wholly outside the state of New York. Now, Ms. Schriefter, I hate to interrupt you so early, but I do have a, a question. I think we all may have this question is, this is a very interesting jurisdictional issue, and we're aware that there was a decision recently in the Appellate Division Second Department, which has now been accepted uh, by the Court of Appeals. A leave has been granted. So. Wouldn't it make sense, don't you think, that we might want to wait to see what the Court of Appeals does on that case before we decide this case? Because it seems to be very much the same issue. Yes, it's exactly the same issue. Uh, but we, I strongly urge this court to grant suppression and would not object to hold off on a decision. 
But I would like to note in terms of that case from the uh, second department, uh, Schneider, yes. that this case was uh, relied, the court relied on three cases that are wholly inapplicable. The New York cases, which only govern inter-county interception rather than interstate interception of communications. Uh, the court relied on United States versus Rodriguez which is a federal case and defines the listening post rule uh, based on federal law. And in fact, was a case where the warrant was issued to intercept communications between New York and New Jersey. So those were not communications made wholly outside the jurisdiction of the issuing court, as well as the Stegman case, which again is based on federal law. There was a federal warrant in that case. And it's not clear from the facts in that case that the communications were made wholly outside uh, the state of New York. So again, this case was incorrectly decided. And uh, while, while it is uh, pending oral argument at this time, um, under my understanding from counsel on that case is that it will be argued in uh, early 2021, but I strongly urge suppression and uh, urge this court to strictly construe the criminal procedure law, section 700. Under that statute, a uh, judge may issue a warrant to intercept communications and to be executed, quote, anywhere in the state. And this court should also follow the policy goals of this statute. This statute is intended to provide centralization of law enforcement. And when a, when a state court is able to encroach on the other, other state's law enforcement, this policy is completely obliterated and respondent would have interception or communications interception of communications wholly outside the state. And thus the New York judges could listen in on to or grant warrants that for anywhere in the nation. And this is not what is what is intended under the statute and what is not intended under case law. Well, I have a question. If the purpose of the statute is centralization, then it seems to me that your position would be contrary to that because then a criminal defendant could be subject to a series of orders from judges in many different states each pursuing the same issue. And it seems to me more sense that if the goal is centralization, then for a New York judge to be able to issue a warrant that allows conversation to be heard concerning this, this criminal transaction, it would result in centralization of the judicial authority concerning this transaction. So why isn't that more in line with the purposes of the statute? But Your Honor, the New York, not all states have the same warrant laws. And for, for in this circumstance, for New York law to govern other states' law and to encroach upon those laws would encroach on the Fourth Amendment uh, rights in anywhere in the nation. And I would like to note that the from the beginning of this investigation, the court and the prosecution was very clearly understanding that Mr. Walker was a North Carolina-based firearms trafficker. The warrant allowed for cell site triangulation, GPS monitoring, all communications, uh, text messages, phone calls were monitored during the time of communication. And the detectives and the prosecution was entirely aware that there were communications made wholly outside the state of New York and North Carolina. In fact, in the extension uh, order for the first warrant, the affidavit stated that Mr. Walker made 4,000 communications, uh, mostly between his phone and other North Carolina area codes. And only two of these communications were made while he was in the state of New York. But would you agree that the, that the fact presenting, presented to the warrant judge showed a nexus to New York of the underlying criminal transaction that formed the basis for the warrant? 
Yes, there was a nexus. However, the this listening post rule, and not only was there a nexus, but of course, the communications were being recorded in North in New York in Kings County. But the listening post rule created by the federal case of United States versus Rodriguez cannot be over broadly um, extended here by this court. Very importantly, this that case has only been interpreted to allow for inter-county communications or interception of inter-county communications, not for communications made wholly outside the state of New York. Okay, um, you've taken your uh, seven minutes. Does any of any of the other justices have any other questions for right now? Okay, you, you have a couple minutes in rebuttal, uh, Ms. Schrader. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, Ms. Axelrod, good well, morning. First, good morning, sorry, Judge. Um, a- since it sounds like defense counsel uh, has no objection to waiting until after the uh, Court of Appeals decision, um, then I would just like to turn to the uh, excessive sentence point just very briefly. Um, since that is, no matter what, well, that is an issue that the court, uh, could think about addressing, um, assuming that we, of course, win on the, um, the the listening post and just urge the court not to reduce the defendant's, um, uh, post-release supervision from five years to three and a half years. The, uh, crimes don't warrant that kind of, um, uh, reduction. And uh, d- defense counsel has the defendant hasn't actually provided any uh, reasons why he should uh, not do the full sentence. Now, as far as the um, the uh, question of uh, execution of a warrant when t- uh, conversations occur wholly outside of the state, I recognize that the federal case doesn't govern us. But the Court of Appeals has repeatedly said that when looking to interpretation of our statutes, we should look to the uh, federal statute because we actually were modeled on that federal statute. So to the degree that the uh, federal courts um, look to see both where this conversation is actually taking place and where the government is listening to it as two critical places to consider when you're considering uh, interception, uh, we we would ask that this court uh, use that same uh, benchmark. The issue is now these sophisticated, especially uh, narcotics organizations, are often going on throughout the country, which means that either we're not going to have enough warning to ask another jurisdiction to uh, issue a wiretap, or even if we do, we're going to be running all over the country trying to get uh, conversations. That um, actually does affect the defendant's privacy because now many more jurisdictions, which means many more judges and many more paralegals and many more prosecutors are actually listening to what the defendant is saying. So it, it increases exponentially the people who are listening to the um, defendant. Uh, I'd also I want to point out that the, the statute speaks in terms of execution and interception. And while it doesn't really expressly, de- it doesn't define execution at all, and it kind of by uh, uh, impliedly defines interception, the thing that it looks at is the government's conduct in terms of where the government is listening to this, the, uh, these, these, the uh, intercepted conversations. Yeah. So it is... This I'm is sorry. Scarpula. Let me just ask you a question. If you if if that is the rule, that would mean essentially that any time a police officer or a detective in the Bro- in Brooklyn listened to a conversation, that would essentially mean that that could happen anywhere in the country under any circumstances. That would broaden that rule to the point that it would not even be a statute. It wouldn't. We wouldn't need a statute mm-hmm. if all the all the police had to show was that the detectives were sitting in an office in Brooklyn listening to the conversation. That can't be right. Well, first of all, we don't get. We aren't allowed to intercept unless we've demonstrated probable cause and that we, the prosecutor, have jurisdiction for that particular crime. We can't just sit there and go. You know, we'd like to see what Texas is up to. So let's just. Uh, you know, go down up on some phones and listen in Brooklyn. That's absolutely what we can't do. And a judge who's a supervisor in in wiretaps, unlike uh, straightforward search warrants, the judge actually has uh, more uh, involvement and is a supervisor of the of the wire. So if the judge thinks that we are overreaching and trying simply to use our statute to get access to another statute, the judge has all the power to say, you know what? Sorry, guys, I won't let you do that because there are too many 
out of jurisdiction calls come back to me when you when you have figured out how you're only going to intercept the calls occurring in, in uh, New York State. So it, I, I know defense counsel has raised that argument, but the bottom line is we can only investigate the cases that we can investigate. And those cases are the only ones we can get authorization to listen to. That doesn't change if it happens that our investigation actually takes us into another state. What we can only listen to under uh, the jurisdictional grant of the court is those conversations occurring in the other state that have to do with our investigation. We have to minimize out the others because we don't have authorization to listen to those. So I know that the defense bar is, is pushing that argument and, and our comeback is simply, that's simply not true. I, uh, I, I I'm sorry. No, I say, I guess we'll be interested to see uh, the uh, Court of Appeals argument, uh, very interesting arguments, obviously. Is there anything else you'd like to add to this? No, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'll rest on my brief. Okay, Any, anybody else? All right, uh, Ms. Schriefter, uh, you'll have two minutes to uh, for rebuttal if anything you'd like to respond to. Yes, yeah, so I'll also begin with the excessive sentence point. I'd like to note that co-defendant Matthew Best was providing his office space to uh, keep the guns, and he was given five years. Uh, so proportionality would govern a lower sentence here. In addition, uh, I would like to note that because Mr. Brown has been released and released approximately one year ago, any reduction here would it still allow for continued post-release supervision. The, a lower, the lowest sentence of three and a half years would still mean one and a half years of post-release supervision. So the, the goal of punishment here would still be met and uh, Mr. Brown would not be automatically off of uh, supervision here. In addition, uh, at the 440-20 hearing, the prosecution commended his work in prison and his all of his vocational training that he did. That vocational training has allowed him to uh, gain employment in North Carolina. He's uh, living with his family in North Carolina. And you said he was released a, about a year ago. Is that what you said? Yes, October Thank 2019. Thank so, you. yes. And he was he was able to sh show his rehabilitation. Sorry, Miss. Uh, it isn't. We don't normally consider post-conviction events in determining whether a sentence is excessive. We consider excessiveness based on the facts available at the time the sentence was given, right? Isn't that? Well, cor correct, but there was a, a new determination after the 440-20 hearing that uh, changed the sentence in light of uh, Mr. Brown's true predicate status. And that, that sentence change was not sufficient enough to properly uh, look at the re rehabilitation, the amount of uh, post-release supervision that Mr. Brown should receive, his traumatic upbringing, his mental health issues, importantly, his very young age at the time of the crime. Uh, he was only 19, and as this court knows, at that age, uh, there's uh, young people engage in reckless behavior due to underdevelopment. And again, he was, he showed his ability for rehabilitation throughout his time in prison and maintained close contact with his family. Okay, and anything further? Cause uh, you've, you've uh, passed your two minutes. Is, uh... I'd just like to conclude that we urge this court to uh, suppress the communications and should, should this court decline to do that, to reduce the sentence to one closer to the minimum. Okay. Thank you. Thank you both very much. Um, Thank you. Okay. Uh, the next case we're going to hear is the Shinogi case. I think the other attorney may have come in on the first case, but let's do that Shinogi case uh, next. If that's if both, I think all both sides are here for that. So, uh, Mr. Flanders, whenever you're ready. May, may it please the court, my name is Ed Flanders, counsel for Shianogi Inc., the plaintiff appellant in this case. This is actually a consolidated appeal of two orders of Supreme Court, one denying Shianogi's motion for partial summary judgment on its right to recover lost profits on Fortimet sales as direct damages, 
and also granting activists' motion for partial summary judgment that it had no obligation to sell the generic version of Fortimet and thus thus cannot be liable for Shinogi's lost profits on that generic product. Now, activists has been in breach of the party's agreements for over three years and to this day has still not resumed deli de uh, delivering Fortimet to Shinogi. Resale of Fortimet tablets was, and the sharing of profits on the sales of the generic version were the lied at the very heart of the party's agreement. Yet it is activists' position that Shionogi is not entitled to recover the benefit of its bargain in the form of, of lost profit, direct damage. In effect, activists is saying, we are free to breach the agreement and Shionogi, you can't do anything about it. That Council, is not what, yes, Council, Justice Ginsburg. It seems to me that the MSA specifically includes a provision saying there's no responsibility for any loss of profits. So I'm, I'm at a, I don't understand the, your argument that that's a claim, that you still have that claim. Sure, Your Honor. And, and I think when you look at 10.4 of the Manufacturing and Supply Agreement, it, it's, its subheading says in all caps, bold and underlined, consequential damages. But now, of course, I mean, we, we all see that, of course, because it's right there, as you indicate. However, um, I believe that the court, uh, the, the trial court, the motion court, and we also see that there is another provision uh, in the agreement that says that the headings really should not be considered. They're just headings and, you, and that they really don't control. So even though it does say that, it, within the context of what it says in there, it would sort of seem to contradict that. So that's, that seems to be a problem also. How do we get around that? Yeah, absolutely, Your Honor. And I think that no New York state court has ever just blindly said, we're going to follow the no headings clause and we're not going to allow it to be used to give context to the, the following text. Now, activist cites Bank of New York Mellon Trust Company versus Merrill Lynch Capital Services. But that the, the, that decision was based on the fact that, that the language, and this is, I'll quote, from, from the first department refers explicitly to inconsistencies between the provisions of the indenture and, and the agreement. And what the court said was, just because there's a definite it's it, there's a definitions heading, we're not gonna contradict the, counsel, the clear counsel, provision. Counsel, this is Judge Gonzalez. How can we go outside, how can you go outside the plain language of your own agreements? Or plain language in both the LPA and the MSA exclude damages for lost profits. The plain language of the agreement says that the point headings cannot be considered in interpreting the agreements made uh, by the parties. How can we go outside the plain language of these documents when there's no confusion here? Well, actually, Your Honor, it doesn't say any direct or consequential lost profits. And we know from the Court of Appeals in Biotronic that those are two very different things. Here, we're talking about direct lost profits, not consequential lost profits. It does not say any direct or consequential lost profits. And the Court of Appeals has said, you can't just, you shouldn't just pluck words out of a contract. You must give them context and is i would it, respectfully counsel, counsel is it the word lost profits all encompassing i i don't believe so your honor especially i mean when you think about this your honor this subheading there are 94 subheadings in the in the manufacturing and sub and uh supply agreement every single one of them accurately describes the following text. It defies credulity to think that two top tier law firms who drafted these agreements would put a heading, a subheading, consequential damages when it, when they wanted to exclude the, the direct and consequential I mean, damages. And what defies credulity to me is that two top law firms would put in a statement that says, don't consider the headings 
because they looked at all the previous cases in which courts did exactly that. These lawyers knew what they were doing. They were not, they were knew exactly what the law was. They knew they had seen all those previous cases where courts had done that, and they specifically and directly said, do not do that in our contract. And there is no possibility that that is confusing or ambiguous. It's straight up, as yeah. is the word lost profits. The problem is you drafted a contract that didn't, you don't now post haste, you don't think you got enough. Well, let me, let me. But the contract I, says what it says. I, I, I agree, Your Honor, but the contract also says consequential damages, and there are different types of lost profits. If they had said, and if they wanted to, they could have said direct or consequential lost profits. I would respectfully submit, Your Honor, that it, it, this court should follow the infrashore uh, decision of the Second Circuit because there, that's a it's a sensible rule. It's not just ignore headings. It's just don't allow a heading to contradict the plain text. And you there, in your document, we didn't make it up. We're not looking at the common law. You've told us in your document not to do it. Now you want us to disregard that in favor of a common law rule that directly contradicts what you've said in your contract. Actually, there was, there was, but your honor, there was a no headings clause in the agreement uh, in the infrashore case. And in fact, it said any dispute and what the court said was, OK, well, we're not just going to disregard the heading because there's a no headings clause. We're going to we're going to say, well, let's use the context here. Let's let it let it have context. And that's all we're asking to do, Your Honor. And and in particular, Mr. because Flanders, in, if interpreting I, Flanders, if, I may, if you look at the lost prof profits clause in the MSA, it says that loss of profits is excluded diminution in value is excluded incidental incidental indirect consequential special exemplary or punitive damages are excluded how much more clear can you be doesn't the agreement tell us what the intention of the parties was doesn't it tell us what the parties bargained for I, I think I think it does when you take into consideration the consequential damages subheading right and and this court um, in the Carver's decision took an identical provision that was entitled no consequential damages and said that the plaintiff here is seeking direct damages and this clause only bars consequential damages it because the, because when you have a heading that is so direct that is so clear that it says no consequential damages I, that court did not ignore it and this court should not All ignore right. it M mr flanders we we have already uh done our eight minutes um i'll give you a couple uh, you have a few minutes for rebuttal and perhaps you can get to the other uh issue in that i'll give you an extra minute if you need it then okay um can i thank hear you, Your Honor. okay thank you very much mr flanders uh can i hear from uh the respondent now you have uh 10 minutes okay mr zimmer yeah thank you very much your honor uh, david zimmer for for activists um, Your Honor, Justice Schechter carefully considered both of the contractual issues before this court, and she correctly concluded uh, that Shinogi's arguments, each of Shinogi's arguments, are flatly contradicted by what the parties actually wrote in their agreements. Um, and I, you know, on the lost profits issue, I think the court pretty clearly understands our position. I just want to respond briefly to some of the points uh, that Mr. Flanders made. The phrase any, any loss of profits is completely unambiguous, it, and it covers, Shinogi has not identified any definition of the word any that does not encompass all. And so the fact that it didn't say any direct or consequential lost profits is irrelevant because any encompass both those kinds and any other kinds that might exist. Um, and the fact, you know, I also think it's important to recognize that even Shinogi conceded in its reply that the damages specified uh, in section 10.4 are not in fact limited to consequential damages in the sense that one of the items listed is punitive damages, which the Court of Appeals has explicitly held is not a form of consequential damages. So there's just absolutely no plausible way to read that provision uh, as limited to consequential damages. And the phrase any loss of profits is completely unambiguous. 
And if you want to look at context in the agreement, you can look at section 2.4.6, uh, which Mr. Flanders didn't even acknowledge, in which, in which Shinogi agreed that its sole remedy in the event of a supply shortfall like this one was the purchase credit that's specified there. So if you look at the agreement as a whole, you look at the provision in context, any loss of profits simply means any loss of profits, and it clearly precludes Shinogi's argument. And the LPA, the, on the other issue, uh, just as clearly precludes um, the positions that Shinogi has taken in this case. Um, what the LPA does uh, is it clarifies, it specifies that activists retains the, retained the complete control over authorized generic format that it had prior to the party's agreements. This was activists' product that activists developed, and the LPA clarifies that activists retained that control. Shinogi's argument is, in effect, that by clarifying that activists was not giving away control over authorized generic format, activists somehow took on these contractual and fiduciary obligations uh, to actually manufacture and sell and distribute a product that it never agreed to manufacture, sell, or distribute. And so um, and this is where the, the court the court found that they had a right to sell this, but they had no obligation, which seems to be backed up by uh, by things. And, and, and could you just speak to that? Yeah, that's exactly right. So what the LPA does, you had this authorized generic format was activists' product. Activists had had the right once there was other generic entry. Activists had the right to uh, sell authorized generic format. It had no obligation. Activists' obligation was that if it sold authorized generic format, then it was required to share its profits with Shinogi. And there's no allegation at all that activists didn't do so. And what Shinogi's trying to do is use these kind of fiduciary and contractual, these extra contractual theories, in order to force activists to do something that it made very clear in the LPA it was not agreeing to do because the LPA makes clear that activists retained its exclusive rights over authorized generic format. And keep in mind, this was a product that activists developed. This was activists' product over which prior to the LPA, activists had complete control. And all that the LPA does is it clarifies that activists retains that control. And the idea that a provision that retains, that, that clarifies the control that activists is retaining would actually impose on activists um, an enormous number of fiduciary and contractual obligations to make the same product it was not agreeing to make uh, m makes no sense. And it would, as Justice Schechter correctly recognized, would fundamentally and impermissibly restructure the party's agreements. And just to briefly go through the specific arguments that Shinogi makes, you know, this joint venture theory, Shinogi can't, hasn't established at least three of the four joint venture requirements. The, the LPA doesn't show any intent of the parties to be associated as joint venture. Shinogi, ar Shinogi's only argument is that by not specifying that it was not a joint venture, that that somehow shows an intent to be a joint venture. That makes no sense. And it would show an intent to be bound as joint ventures anytime the parties didn't specify that they were not joint ventures. This was a product over which activists had complete control, which is an independent reason to reject the joint venture theory. Shinogi cites sort of a potpourri of provisions in the LPA that it claims show control. If you actually read those provisions, most of them are about the brand, not the generic. They're completely irrelevant. And the few that aren't involve generic cooperation agreements that any arm's length profit sharing agreement would contain. They don't show any control over the authorized generic uh, project. Law sharing, same thing. There is it, The issue here isn't that there wasn't equal law sharing. There was no law sharing. Shinogi has liability for none of the losses associated with author, authorized generic format. Um, the only provisions that, that Shinogi really relies on are the fact that in calculating profits, uh, the LPA deducts costs from revenue. That's just what a profit sharing agreement is. And the law, what profit is, it's crystal clear under the cases we cite in our briefs that defining profits as revenue minus cost does not make an agreement a law sharing agreement. Similarly, Shinogi cites an indemnification provision in 10.2 of the LPA. If you go read that, it is again about the brand. It has nothing to do with authorized generic format. So there is just no way that Shinogi's sole role with AG format was to cash a check. That is it. And that does not create a law sharing agreement. It does not show control. It does not show an intent to be bound. The implied covenant fails for very similar reasons. It is indisputable. Even the case of Shinogi sites establish that the implied covenant cannot be used to impose obligations that are not in the party's agreements. There can be no serious dispute that that's exactly what Shinogi is doing here. Um, Shinogi is seeking to use the implied covenant to force activists to sell this product under circum certain circumstances, even though the agreement itself makes clear that activists retains its exclusive rights, including the right to sell or not sell for any reason at all. Um, and, I, you know, I think just quickly on the UCC issue, the UCC doesn't even apply uh, and, and neither does the course of performance issue. And, and, and I think Shinogi all but gives that up in the reply. So 
If the court has no questions, I'm happy to rest on the briefs. Any of uh, my colleagues have any questions? Thank you, Mr. Zimmer. Uh, Mr. Flanders, you have a few minutes to uh, reply. Perhaps you want to deal with some of the issues on that second issue, which we didn't, uh, you didn't have a chance to get to the first time. Thank, thank you, Your Honor. But real quickly on the first issue, so so th there's this interpreting the 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 no profits clause would lead the way that activist wants leaves uh, Shianogi with no remedy. 2.4.6 does not provide a remedy for a complete failure to supply. It, it is only a 10% rebate against few, uh, credit against future orders. There are no future orders because they completely stopped producing. But even even if it counsel, the lack of a remedy is not something created out of whole cloth. It's what derives from the plain language of the contract. No but, one is suggesting something other than what the contract says. And I just but, don't see where your theory that you're entitled to those damages comes from based on the plain language of the contract. And frankly, I haven't, in your presentation, I haven't heard where you've shown us where that could come from. Well, it, under this, this contract is clearly governed by the UCC. It's the sale of uh, prescription products. Under the UCC, even if there is a sole remedy, if the sole remedy fails of its essential purpose, then it must be stricken and the plaintiff is entitled to recover its benefit of the bargain damages. If, if that 10% if that, if that credit is, is the only remedy that Shianogi has, it has failed of its essential purpose because it is meaningless when you have a complete failure to supply. Now, with respect to the, um, uh, the AG here, Shinogi has three separate arguments, and Mr. Zimmer really didn't uh, adequately address them. First of all, there are clearly disputed issues of fact as to whether or not there is a joint venture. And I think the first department um, precedent on this is quite clear. And if there's a joint venture, then uh, then activist owes Shinogi a duty of loyalty to not act in its own interest against the interests of Shinogi. But, but Mr. Flanders, um, we're... There does not seem to be any indication in this agreement that, in fact, there was going to be a joint venture. And some of the elements that you would look for to prove a joint venture are not there. For instance, um, there's no loss sharing um, and, and there's no indication uh, that there was. So I, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out where you get the joint venture. I mean, maybe there should be a breach of fiduciary duty if there was one, but I don't see where there is one in this agreement. So, so with respect to law sharing in Don Singer, this this court said in in no uncertain terms, when you have certain circumstances where there's no reasonable expectation of losses, the fact that there's no express law sharing provision is not fatal to a joint venture. And I know Justice Scarpula authored the, the, the you have the lawyers have have blown that up. <laughs> in such an incredibly ridiculous way. I'm going to tell you, you're never going to get me on that. These are two <laughs> sophisticated lawyers. They know if they want to create a joint venture, the first thing they're going to put is joint venture on the document. And the fact that they didn't uh, provide for loss sharing straight up, to me, I, I find that the lawyers are trying to stretch that provision in a way that it was never intended to be. Stretched. Well, first, first of all, there is loss sharing, you know, so so number one, there's going to be no losses in terms of actually producing the eight, the generic version because they have to produce the, the brand version anyway. But the only real losses you're going to experience are from third party claims. And we are expressly indemnified from and we have to indemnify activists for third party claims. We also, the selling expenses reduce the profits. And I think, you know, here, the, the, you know, all of the cases that activist sites are either when, when uh, on, a, on a dismissal of a complaint that directly contradicts the elements or after full discovery. We haven't had full discovery here. You know, we're st we, we are, in fact, we haven't even been entitled to any discovery on the joint venture issue because we, can, can I just ask you to finish up? I gave you a lot of extra minutes, mostly because Mr. Zimmer didn't take his, but sure. I need you to just like, um, you got just to have one minute to finish up. Thank sure. you so much. And so if we put the, if we just put aside the joint venture for a moment, 
where you have a discretionary right, a contract that contemplates the ex exercise of discretion, this pledge includes a promise not to act arbitrarily or irrationally in exercising this discretion. That is Dalton v. Educational Testing Services, the New York Court of Appeals. Rich Bell also, this court said, separate and apart from a joint venture and a duty of loyalty, said, quote, an explicitly discretionary contract right, end quote, is governed by the implied covenant and may not be exercised arbitrarily or, quote, in bad faith so as to frustrate the other party's right to the benefit under the agreement, end quote. So even if there's no joint venture, there is a clear discretionary right. There is a, the, 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 the Court of Appeals and this, this department has said in no uncertain terms that cannot be exercised in bad faith, irrationally or, or arbitrarily. And that is exactly what we had alleged. And that's what I think we can prove. Th thank you very much. We have your briefs. We will look over these issues. Thank you both uh, very much for the argument, Mr. Flanders and Mr. Zimmer. Have a good a good day. Thank you. Um, is uh, Are both sides here now on that first case, People versus Irvin? Ms. Reed and Ms. Morse, are you both available now? Yes. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Okay, good. And could we do that one next? That's the first case on the calendar, everybody. People versus Irvin. Uh, Ms. Reed? Yes, Your Honor. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the court. Ariel Reed for Appellant Latour Irvin. Mr. Irvin unequivocally invoked his right to counsel when he asked to call his attorney during the interrogation. Rather than permit him to do so, the interrogation continued. Because the statement that followed was admitted in violation of his Sixth Amendment Counsel, right. This is Judge Gonzalez. I'm going to stop you right there because I need to stop you after the word unequivocal. So you would agree that the defendant had an opportunity to use a telephone. Is that right? Yes, Your Honor. He had an opportunity to use the telephone after he asked to speak to his wife uh, and son later on in the interview. And, and that and he had an opportunity at that point to also call his lawyer am i right no your honor he did not have an opportunity to call his lawyer at that point i think the context around that request and what what actually happened there illustrates why he did not have the opportunity to call his lawyer so he had asked to call his lawyer previously his phone was not produced they continued talking later on. He asked if he could call his wife. At that point, the investigator got his, gave him his phone. Mr. Urban was actually in the video scrolling through his phone. The investigator asked, who are you calling? Um, and he explained his wife. And then they sat there, both the investigator and the DA sat across the table from him to ensure that he was actually calling who he said he was calling. Um, and I'm sure all of your honors can imagine sitting across the table from an ADA and an investigator and they're asking you, are you making sure that you're calling your wife? You're not going to surreptitiously try to call your lawyer at that point. And it honestly never should have been a surreptitious action to begin with. When Mr. Irvin asked to call his lawyer in the first instance, he should have been given the opportunity to do so then. If the onus shouldn't have been placed on him to when he finally gets his phone for the purpose of calling his wife, try to sneak and call his attorney. That's not the way the Sixth Amendment operates. It doesn't put the onus on individuals being interrogated to try to surreptitiously call their lawyers after they've made an unequivocal request to do so. Um, here, Mr. Urban asked at the, the point of inception, can I put my lawyer on speakerphone right now? At that point, his phone should have been provided to him and he should have been permitted to call his lawyer. Instead, what happened was the DA asked superfluous follow-up questions like, are you asking to speak with an attorney? And even then, in response to that why question, would, why, why, would, why that would that be superfluous? Because there was nothing unequivocal about the initial request. Your Honor, can I put my lawyer on speakerphone right now is, as uh, Justice Scarpula said in the previous matter, straight up. It was clear. It was plain. It was there was nothing ambiguous about can I put my lawyer on speakerphone. So then to go on and ask him, well, are you asking to speak to a lawyer? That's unnecessary. And even then, in response to that unnecessary question, Mr. Irvin confirmed that that's what he wanted to do. He said, I mean to, to, to continue the interview with him on the phone present. 
And even then, so that's a confirmation that, yes, I want to speak to my attorney. And even then, the prosecutor went on, rather than giving Mr. Irvin his phone, to reiterate his Miranda rights. And Mr. Irvin wasn't confused about his Miranda rights. He was attempting to invoke them. Explaining, and so, explaining that, the, that, the, that the prosecutor repeated the Miranda rights, the Miranda the, warnings? I'm not complaining that the prosecutor repeated the Miranda warnings, Your Honor. I'm saying that at the moment. Distraction? I do. I believe that Mr. Irvin, and I think the, the transcript bears out the fact that Mr. Irvin unequivocally said, can I call my lawyer? Rather than giving him the phone to do that, the prosecutor tried to continue the interrogation. And I think ultimately what happened is that they kept talking so much that he finally said, well, can I at least talk to my wife? And at that point, the phone was produced. Um, and the Sixth Amendment right is not an exercise in perseverance. People shouldn't have to ask two, three, four times in order for their right to be respected. The, the Constitution requires at the first instance of an unequivocal invocation of the right to counsel that that be respected. That terminates the interview. His phone is provided. He gets an opportunity to have his lawyer on the phone. If he wants to continue with the interview after speaking with his attorney, that's fine. But the idea that you can just steamroll and hope that if you keep talking, the the suspect might you know back up or walk away from the initial request is just antithetical to the principles of the sixth amendment um there's no reason why after mr irvin said can i call my lawyer can i put my lawyer on speakerphone that anything other than sure here's your phone should have occurred um and that's the reality of the 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 constitutional requirement for the sixth amendment you can't keep talking and hope that the person will walk back their original statement. Um, and I think that part of the, the, um, the issue with this is that both below in the suppression court and on appeal, respondent has had difficulty getting around that basic fact. They offer really honestly outlandish interpretations of what is essentially an, an unambiguous request. They say that when Mr. Irvin asked to talk to his lawyer, the fact that he later asked to talk to his wife just meant that he wanted his attorney to be a, to act as a messenger for a message to his family. It, it makes no sense. The only thing, the only possible interpretation of can I put my lawyer on speakerphone is I need to talk to a lawyer. And, and I believe if you look at what Mr. Irvin said immediately before that, when he said, um, he was talking about not wanting to incriminate himself. Um, the, you know, he wants to help, but he doesn't want to incriminate himself. At that point, you know, the DA says, well, I'm not your lawyer. I can't tell you, you know, whether you're going to incriminate yourself or not. And that's, that moment is when he said, well, can I put my lawyer on speakerphone? There's literally nothing that could possibly be deemed unequivocal about that sequence of events. Um, right. so Miss Miss Reed, you, you finished. That. Does anyone else want to ask a question now, or can we give uh, let her? She has a couple of minutes in rebuttal. Is that okay? Okay. Thank you very much, Miss Reed. Uh, Miss Morse for the people. Sorry. Yes. Um, May I please the court? My name is Deborah Morse, and I represent the people on appeal. The remark here was not an unequivocal invocation. The remark was unusual and unclear, uh, the idea of a lawyer on speakerphone. So the prosecutor sought to clarify what the uh, what the defendant was asking. He did not, con I'm Ms. sorry. Ms. Morse, I have a question. Once, But once the defendant said, um, I'd like to continue the interview with him on the phone present, why wouldn't the appropriate thing have been for the detective I'm sorry, the ADA to just hand him his phone and say, okay, call him and we'll continue the interview with him on the phone. Why wouldn't that have been more appropriate? I'm sorry. Uh, well, actually, you know, it happened step by step. I mean, it, 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 that is what happened ultimately in the sense that um, when the prosecutor clarified and asked, are you asking to speak to an attorney? because he wanted to clarify what the defendant meant. Defendant ducked it and just repeated. Um, and so the prosecutor properly viewed it as not an unequivocal, but he said, yes, you can. As soon as the prosecutor said that defendant could have the attorney on the speakerphone, defendant backed away and said, well, he really just wanted to speak to his wife and son. 
And this is all on uh, page 26 of the transcript. So and I, this I, is- I have that page open. I'm just, I, what I don't understand is when the, when the defendant said, I mean to continue the interview with him on the phone present, and then the ADA says, the answer is yes, of course you can. Why at that point wouldn't the appropriate thing for the ADA have done to match his words with an action and hand the defendant the phone so he could call his lawyer and have him present? Because, Your Honor, once the, once the prosecutor said, yes, of course you can, defendant actually said, well, I really don't, I really just want to speak to my wife and son. At that point, the defendant didn't say, yes, let's do that. He didn't take him up on He didn't take the prosecutor up on it. He backed away from it and said, no, nah, I really just want to speak to my wife and son because he really did want to speak. He wanted to continue the, in, the interview because it was in his, he felt it was in his interest. He had something to gain. And once it came out that, you know, he could do it, he didn't say, okay, let's go ahead. And he immediately backed away. So this is not a situation where there was an unequivocal invocation in the beginning and you're looking to later use subsequent events to reflect back. Here, it really was a situation where the original, the original remark was not unequivocal. So once the prosecutor clarified, the defendant made it clear that he wanted to speak to his wife and son, and he explained the idea about, you know, I was, and he mentioned it even earlier in the interview before this, where he was worried, you know, he was concerned that he was arrested in front of his six-year-old child, and the child would think he just wanted the, as, as the defendant put it, he wanted the child to know that daddy, you know, was helping the police, it's not a problem. Um, once it became clear, I would also point out to your owners that once it became, the defendant at this point thought it would help him to speak to the police, so he wanted to continue the interview. But once it became clear that he didn't, he wasn't going to get anything out of it, the next day when the, when the uh, questioners came back, by that time it was clear he wasn't going to get any help on his other case from talking to these police officers. So he made it clear when he wanted a lawyer, he said, uh, no, I don't want to speak to you. Um, and he made an unequivocal invocation of his right to counsel, and at that point the questioning stopped. There was no question. Counsel, I, I wonder if, uh, this is Judge Kaplan, I was wondering if we could go to the Batson application uh, sure. uh, issue. Because, I, I mean, I was somewhat concerned, um, and I wonder if you could address uh, when the, dif when the uh, district attorney had to give the uh, alleged non-racial, non-gender, uh, neutral, uh, excuses, the non-protectual reason, pretextual reasons. I was somewhat concerned about, you know, what those were and the court kind of let it drop after that, or maybe the defendant did, but could you address that? Cause I was somewhat concerned about sure. some of the statements there. Sure. If I, if I could just put in one plug that afterwards, if there's time, I would love to just make a strong harmless error argument on the hearing in case there's any issue about the right to counsel. But absolutely. Um, the sure. prosecutor made a mistake. The prosecutor made, on the Batson, the prosecutor made a mistake about one part of the application, but it had nothing to do with race. Um, at the time, defendant, at this at trial, defendant never claimed that anything the prosecutor said uh, with respect to love, um, I assume we're talking about the uh, the juror that uh, the defendant mentions in, in her reply brief, love. Um, yeah. The only I one. I mean, that, there were left. seven of them, but you can, you know, if you could just address there were, them. There were, Your Honor, but I think I think it's because in our brief we outlined several reasons, all you know, significantly objective, uh, alternative reasons um, for for not. Uh, for, for for a bias, and that's, I believe, why defense counsel at that point just limited in her reply brief to the one juror love. Um, right. And I just want to say that, okay, so one thing is, it's significant that at trial, when, when uh, the prosecutor gave this reason, um, there was never any suggestion by defense counsel, by the court, that there was anything about race involved. You know, once the prosecutor gave the explanation, Ms. the defendant Moore, objected. Ms. Moore, yes, I'm sorry. Could you focus, please, given the limited amount of time that we have, could you focus on, on the question before you, which um, in my view does concern Miss Love and uh, 
the uh, prosecutor's reasoning that she should be stricken because Miss Love was unconcerned about living on government assistance. Could you just address that? I understand. I understand that. Um, well, just just address that first, please. Okay, sure. I'm sorry, Your Honor. I thought I thought I was getting to it slowly, but um, the, the prosecutor the, the prosecutor explained that that he struck Love because of a combination of the fact that she was unemployed and she was shopping, spending money shopping. Those were supported by the record. The notion that she was not that she was you know, had a, had a, um, a lack of concern about providing support for herself. Those were true, those were supported by the record. The problem was, the mistake that the prosecutor made was that he, he made a reference to not being concerned that she was on government assistance, when in fact, the, she never specified, the juror was unemployed, but she never specified where her, what her means of support was. But the real point is that Nobody caught this mistake at the time. Defense counsel adopted as true the fact that she was on government assistance. His objection, the defense counsel's objection, was even people on government assistance are entitled to uh, shop. What, what, in fact, nobody, nobody suggested at the time that there was anything about race. The judge, the, the, the defense lawyer, nobody suggested, because being on government assistance is not something connected to race. Everybody knows that anybody can be on government assistance, whether no matter what your racial you know, uh, category is. And the fact that nobody raised it at the time, meaning defendant didn't raise it at the time, defendant didn't catch the fact that there was no reference to government assistance. The prosecutor, it's because but even even if they had and if they had the prosecutor could have clarified but it's more what, exactly what he meant but it's more than a technical preservation argument it's the fact that the, the fact that nobody until now years later mentioned anything about uh race is because at the time when this happened it didn't sound it didn't have that negative connotation the idea is that in this case he made it the prosecutor made it clear that it was the combination of being unemployed and shopping and not being concerned about providing for yourself and you know being cavalier about support. Like I said, the 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 only mistake that he all of those things were supported by the record. Nothing to do with race. The fact that he thought that she was on government assistance and that apparently defense counsel also did because he made it his defense counsel's objection at the time, which the court uh, you know, had no problem with, is that somehow the prosecutor was being, didn't like poor people. That's what defense counsel said was suggested by, by the, pro, pardon me, by the prosecutor's okay, argument. Miss, so, Miss Morse, I'm, I'm just going to ask yes. you to finish up. You asked me for a minute to say something about a, a harmless error. So why don't you do that now? Cause you're kind of over your time, please. Oh, thank okay. You. I'm sorry. Ron. No, that's I'm okay. Sorry. Hard well, to do it this way. Okay. okay. <laughs> thank you. Uh, there are two harmless error aspects here. I, I, you know, I believe that the record supports the hearing court's ruling, but there's a. It was harmless in two respects. First of all, even before the speakerphone reference during the statement itself, defendant says enough that incriminates him uh, in a significant way. He says Woodward is his, Woodward's best friend. He knows that Woodward went to New York to pick up uh, drugs and money. That he was uh, that Woodward was sending drugs and money to New York and picking up money there to bring to California, and defendant also incriminates himself in this whole process and says he was helping with the shipping. So just with the from the statement alone, that was enough. In addition to that, in addition to that part of the statement, which nobody's contesting because it happened before the speakerphone reference. With respect to the trial evidence itself, it was the only claim the defendant had at trial was that he didn't know that the boxes were filled with cocaine. He thought it was a different drug, he thought it was marijuana. The evidence that he knew that was absolutely overwhelming without the statement. Defendant is the one who dealt directly with the cocaine supplier, Mason. Mason, the cocaine supplier, set the price and told the price to defendant. Defendant introduced his son to the cocaine supplier. Defendant taught his son how to package cocaine for shipment. Defendant told his son which box of cocaine to send where, how many kilos of cocaine okay, to put in uh, each box. I, I got to ask you to wrap up. I'm sorry. So, okay. um, 
I, I think we I think we got your point. We have the briefs um, and okay. we will we will take another look at that. Uh, Miss Reed, you have two minutes uh, in rebuttal. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. I'm just going to briefly address um, one aspect of the statement suppression issue and then turn to the Batson point. Sure. Um, I just want to be clear that everything my adversary said in her um, in her response deals with things that came after the initial unequivocal request. The Constitution is clear that you cannot use things that come after the unequivocal request to cast doubt on the what came before it. Um, the fact of the matter is, when Mr. Irvin asked to talk to his attorney, his phone was not produced. It clearly could have been produced because it was produced later when he wasn't asking to talk to his attorney. I think all of the evidence there suggests that, you know, this was a calculated um, situation and that, you know, Mr. Irvin's constitutional right to counsel was not respected when it should have been at the inception. Um, with respect to the Batson point, um, I just want to, and I, I touched on this in my brief, I just want to note that um, there were numerous white jurors who were unemployed and who said that they had expensive hobbies, probably more expensive hobbies like traveling. The assumption that they were receiving welfare was never part of the ca prosecutor's, ca prosecutor's calculation. I think we all understand why that is. Um, you don't even have to look at its bats in point. I mean, later on in the, in the so, question. So counsel, counsel, was that claim preserved? Did defense counsel at that time say this is racial, this is an indicia of racial discrimination? Your Honor, I, don't recall, I don't recall that in the record. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Yes, Your Honor. At the end of the Batson application, defense counsel said a lot of things. Um, he didn't specifically say that, you know, this is racial discrimination. He said that it was offensive. He said that, you know, he was clearly getting emotional about it to, to, to my adversary's point about nobody recognize it, it, it having a negative connotation. I can assure you that it had a negative connotation at that time. I can also assure you that defense counsel picked up on it. He was getting emotional. He had to assure the court that he wasn't getting mad. Um, he didn't I use the words. Emotional is not the same as preserving it. Your Honor, I'm not saying I, that. Yes. I understand that. I understand the question about it being offensive. But I, we still have to deal with preservation, and the fact that he got emotional is not the same as preserving it. Was there preservation here? Yes, Your Honor. I'm, I'm not. I, you know, as I, as I noted, defense counsel, his articulation of this was clumsy. So we're not, we're not claiming that he um, specifically said the exact arguments that we made on appeal. We're just, you know, we think that the the, the racial discrimination in this case was so blatant and it's and so pervasive that you know. To the extent the court finds it unpreserved, it should reach the issue in the interest of justice because, you know, equal protection, racial discrimination has no place in jury selection, regardless of whether counsel can articulate. And, and exactly. counsel, you make that you make that argument, even though um, ultimately the prosecutor selected three African American women, one of whom was rejected by defense counsel. Yes, Your Honor. I mean, I, in the Constitution, it's clear that you can have racial discrimination and a Batson violation based on the wrongful exclusion of just one jury. It doesn't, this isn't a, you know, a, a quota system. Every individual person on that jury, including Miss Love, had the right to be treated with dignity and not be excluded on the basis of perverse negative racial stereotypes. And if she was, then that's a, a violation of both her and Mr. Irvin's rights, regardless of the other black woman. Thank you. All right. Th thank you. Anybody else have anything? Okay. Thank you both very much. We'll take another look at it. Have a nice afternoon. Thank you for the argument. Thank you. Um, the, next, the next case that's scheduled for argument is People versus Banyan. Uh, both sides available for that? Hello, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Yes, sir. You may proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. My name is Joshua Luke Rushing. I'm representing the appellant Jonathan Banyan on behalf of the Center for Appellate Litigation. Uh, there's really two main issues we want to focus on here today. The first one is the justification issue, and the second one is the suppression of the CCRB records. So starting off with the justification charge, uh, the people have already conceded that the only way they can win this point is if there was no reasonable view of the evidence that the actions Mr. Banyan took were a reasonable reaction to the excessive force applied by the police. So I'd like to back up a little bit to talk about some of the facts so we can fill in some of those terms with what actually happened in this case. 
Uh, we're fortunate that there were actually two videos of the encounter. Uh, and in our brief, we strongly urge the court to view the videos. I certainly hope you have. Yes, I think we all, we all have seen them, actually. Thank you. Uh, that's they, wonderful. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, so the first video uh, begins with Mr. Banyan standing. His feet are planted the entire time. His feet never move during the video. His arms are raised. One arm is clear in the video. The other one is slightly obstructed, but his posture implies it's raised as well. There's a distance between the officer that approaches him and Mr. Banyan when the video begins, and it's a very short video. So at the beginning, Mr. Banyan is here and his feet are planted. It is the officer who closes all of that distance in a very small amount of time. Mr. Banyan does not move. The officer makes all of the moves, and they're so rapid that when he gets to Mr. Banyan, he actually pushes him off screen. So the second video picks up some seconds later. By this point, more officers have responded. Uh, Jonathan Banyan at this point is face down on the ground. There's approximately 10 officers around him. Uh, on the video, you can see that they pick him up by all four limbs and they drop him face down on the sidewalk. Uh, they are kicking and punching him. The officers testify, and it's clear in the video that he was tased two times in the back. Uh, and then they also applied uh, what they refer to uh, as a pain inducing compliance technique um, where they took a 12 inch metal baton. They pushed it into the back of Mr. Achilles or Mr. Banyan's Achilles tendon, and then they rolled it about 12 inches up his leg back and forth just to induce as much pain as possible. I can see some of you grimacing even in the audience. It sounds very painful and I have no doubt that it is. Um, so that is the excessive force part of the comparison. Mr. Banyan's action was what he was convicted of, which was a kick to Lieutenant Rule's knee. The jury has some questions about whether it was Mr. Banyan that kicked him. The jury may have concluded, we don't know, that it was one of the officers that kicked Lieutenant Rule, but nonetheless, the question is whether that one kick, that one leg coming out of a pile was an overreaction to the excessive police force that had already been applied. And obviously it was not. Now, one really important thing to keep in mind here is that this is about that specific moment in time. Mr. Banyan was only convicted of that kick, except for the resisting arrest, but of the assault charge, he was only convicted of that kick. So that kick- He was acquitted, of, he was acquitted of, the, um, of the assault to the other officer. Yes, uh, Your Honor. He was acquitted of an assault against Officer Teneriello uh, for hurting his pinky finger. But what, I, believe I mean, what you're asking, what you're asking here on this point is that the defendant was entitled to a justification charge. I mean, what the what the jury would have determined is difficult. But I mean, it's whether or not there was a reasonable view. Um, so. In, That's I, exactly I, I, correct, we, Your Honor. we looked at those tapes. I, I looked at those tapes. I mean, they're not. I don't know if I could uh, interpret them exactly like you do. I mean, I, I'm not sure they're as easy to interpret as you indicate. I mean, there were fl lights flashing in the back. It was kind of unclear. And there were a lot of cops there. That I will agree. It's a little tough to see. But the issue is, could we say that there was no reasonable view of the evidence that he was the victim of excessive police force? And that's what the judge decided by not giving the excessive force, I mean, the justification charge. Yes, Your Honor. And the judge on this one, frankly, factually made far too strong of a call and what I think is really more of a toss up situation. This was a question for the jury. The jury really should have known that they had the option to take this justification route. They had the option to look at that video and say these officers use excessive force when the trial judge. Sorry, Your Honor, were you about to ask something? Oh, in and out. Would you also think that the questions that they asked also suggested that they were almost surprised that they didn't get such a charge? Yes, Your Honor. The questions almost asked for a justification charge, even if the members of the jury didn't have the legal training to know what it was called. Precisely. I think back on your long legal careers. I'm sure you've come across many criminal cases or tried them yourselves. Try to think of all the jury notes you've seen where the jury asked if they could nullify maybe it's one I kind of doubt it. It's probably zero amongst all four of you. That's a very extraordinary circumstance. And I think it just goes to show how incredible the people's argument is that this justification, the failure to give the justification charge was a harmless error. How could you possibly say that a jury that asked if they could nullify 
would not have taken a justification charge if it had been, if it had been presented to them. You're absolutely correct. I mean, it's I guess really, that's not, I mean, I don't think that's really what we have to, uh, I mean, we'll base it on that, but it's really just based on the evidence that was before the court at the time that the defendant asked for that charge. And uh, there was, of course, more than just uh, the video, but uh, there was a, mm-hmm. a lot of testimony there. So okay. uh, while that's being brought up, and I want to save a little bit of time to talk about the CCRB hearing, would you like me yeah, to move to that yeah, or can I please? Uh, uh, yeah, why don't you do that, that now? Yeah. Okay. You yes, could just so, briefly. Yes, Your Honor. So uh, at the trial court, uh, there was uh, a motion by defense counsel to get these CCRB records and to be able to ask full questions about this encounter that the exact same three officers had had with Julian Day. Uh, so in the time since the case has happened, uh, there have been two major developments here. One, People versus Rouse. I'd like to talk about that. That's a decision from the Court of Appeals, and it is extraordinarily similar to what happened here. In People versus Rouse, two police officers had been asked to testify in a federal trial. The federal judge at a preliminary preliminary hearing had found that there was reason to doubt their credibility and to doubt their testimony, and he precluded the evidence. Later, at a different trial on different charges, the, uh, those police officers' testimony was also a very important part of the people's case, and defense counsel sought to bring out that a federal judge had previously found that they were unreliable and that their testimony might not be credible. So, I, I mean, uh, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you only because we're, we're on please, a time please. thing, but um, does it make a difference in People versus Rouse that there was a prior judicial determination, whereas in our case, they were just uh, before the CCRB and there wasn't a final judicial type of, of a procedure? Does that make a difference in your opinion? Is that a distinction? No, Your Honor. That definitely does not make, an, make a difference. And the Court of Appeals feels the same way because they laid out the reasons that they gave the decision that they did uh, in Rouse. They uh, relied on the factors in People versus Smith. So the way that people would have it is this case is completely different because it's an administrative panel instead of a judge. But the reality is there's a lot of reasons to give the CCRB the same amount of credit. It's a three member panel. Uh, the cops have the opportunity to be represented by counsel. Uh, they can make their case of it. The three person panel investigates it. They do this full time. That's all they do. They substantiate fewer than 20 percent of cases, fewer than one in five cases. So this is not a finding that they make lightly or that they give out all the time and casually. And as I said before, this is something they do full time. They're experts in this. Yes, Your Honor. I'm going to ask you such a basic question. Um, that you'll probably be surprised if if the CCRB is to have any value, don't the determinations of the CCRB have some kind of import in a criminal court proceeding as well as in a civil court proceeding? Uh, yes, Your Honor, I would think they would definitely have import in any what's case. The, in other words, what's the purpose of for why do we have a CCRB if their determinations mean nothing, that their determinations cannot be used. Uh, and precisely. I'm going to ask this question also of the, the people. I precisely agree with you, Your Honor, particularly given the repeal of 50A, which is going to open up those complaints. The legislature is right now expressing a very clear preference that they want this information out there. They want defendants, they want citizens to be able to use it. They're letting us know, lawyers and judges, that they see a national problem with police violence and that this is how they want to address it and they think steps need to be made. The CCRB exists for a reason. If we can't use CCRB hearings in a Rouse setting, then that makes, I think that makes both Rouse useless and the CCRB useless. As I said before, the only difference between Rouse and here is whether you want to put all of the weight on the fact that in Rouse, it was a federal judge as opposed to the CCRB, which is a three member panel who, as I add, only handles these types of cases. Federal judges hear all sorts of cases. They certainly hear police cases. Yes, Your Honor. I, I, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I've given you uh, several extra minutes because it's an interesting argument. Um, I, I'm wondering if we could, uh, uh, if you could hold any other uh, comments till your rebuttal, if that would be okay. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you Absolutely. very much, thank you. Mr. Cohn. Um, thank you. Good af- Good morning. Your Honor. Um, good morning, David Cohn for the people. Is, is my audio finally working? Uh, okay. I think we, it's yeah. I hear you. It's a little. Uh, it's fuzzy. But anyway, uh, why don't you talk because uh, it's better than before. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Well, I hope it's better now. I turned up the volume a little bit. Okay, so uh, we have, as counsel, uh, presented two, two main issues in this case, and I'd like to 
with the court's indulgence, try to go through the evidence a, a little uh, as patiently as time will permit, because I think that's very important here. So in the justification charge context, as the Court of Appeals has recognized, there has to be a reasonable view of the evidence supporting a justification charge. It can't be any view of the evidence. It can't be speculation. Now, of course, a defendant does not have to testify to get a justification charge, but if the defendant does not testify, there has to be some other evidence in the record. Well, I, I mean, this, as counsel indicated, uh, in this particular case, in addition to everything else, there happened to have been two videos, and um, uh, uh, which you don't get in too many, too many of the cases, uh, maybe more so now than before. But anyway, we did have those, and and that second video where there are approximately ten police officers there it wasn't a hundred percent clear to me exactly what was going on, but. Given that it wasn't 100 percent clear, I'm wondering how there couldn't have at least been a reasonable view. It doesn't mean a view, absolute view. It was a reasonable view. So taking into consideration all the testimony and this videotape, how is that not at least a reasonable view that there was at least issue? That doesn't mean the jury was going to find it. That doesn't mean absolutely was. It was a view, a reasonable view. Well, Your Honor, we have to put everything in context. And the Starbucks video was something that happened late in the encounter. So we can't just jump there without looking at what happened first. So of course, as the legislature how is- long, stated, I mean, how long was the encounter? I mean, the whole encounter wasn't, I mean, it was the encounter. I mean, it was part of the encounter. It, it was a few minutes, but if I, if I may just- um, Sure. If the court will indulge me to just try to go review- ahead, go ahead. Uh, what, what we believe is the critical evidence here. First, it's critical that the legislature does not want people to resist arrest by using force, right? Penal Law 3527 says that a person cannot resist an arrest, even an unauthorized arrest by, by the use of force. There's only one exception to that, which is recognized by case law. And that's if a person is using force necessary to prevent an, uh, basically an unjustified assault by the police. Now there's some other key justification principles in addition to that. An initial aggressor is not entitled to a justification charge. And also, if a but person who is being well, arrested can, is can, just Wait, wait counsel, let, let Judge Gessler ask a question. I, I, let me just stop you right there when you're talking about the initial aggressor. Detective Tenariello acknowledged in his testimony that he hit defendant first. So uh, given the detective's Acknowledgement of that, I don't understand why this, why what you just said about who the aggressor, whether or not the aggressor has a right to a justification charge, is at all applicable yeah. here. And I have a follow-up question too, but I'd like you to answer that one first. Well, Your Honor, first, uh, Officer Dianarello did not say that he, uh, that he hit the defendant first. He yeah. said after Sorry. the defendant refused the order to turn around and face the wall, and it's undisputed that the defendant refused the order to turn around and face the wall. He gave him a push to push him up against the wall in accordance with standard police procedure to get the situation under control before they have any sort of conversation about the validity of the arrest. And that is standard police procedure. But and the case law says- You would not the defendant before a defendant did anything else. Defendant was standing planted with his arms up when Officer Tenorelio pushed him against the wall, right? You acknowledge that he did that first? Actually, Your Honor, that's not what the video shows, and that's not what the trial judge said the video shows. The okay. trial judge said that, that the, video, that the I, idea that the defendant was raising his hands and surrender, surrender just isn't there on the video. In fact, that's not how testimony I'm sorry. Just, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, Judge. But let me ask you another question about the Starbucks video. I understand that it was you, it was your office who introduced the Starbucks video into evidence, and that the one you introduced into ed evidence was apparently clearer than the one that we have now, and that you no longer have that. Defense counsel came up with a, a copy, I guess, of the Starbucks video, which is less clear. Shouldn't we resolve any ambiguity in, the, in this uh, fuzzy video against the people, since it was the people's obligation to produce that, their own exhibit to us so we could see it? Your, Your Honor, first, we don't agree that there were two Starbucks videos here. In fact, that's just speculation by do defense have, counsel. It, it, do you have the video that was introduced into evidence? 
we have not been able to locate the files, and, and, and we acknowledge that. And, and the one that was produced to us less clear than the one that you introduced into evidence? I, I don't think that there's any evidence in the record saying that. And, and, and I know I see counsel nodding his head, but that's actually just counsel's opinion. There's nothing to suggest that. The counsel's opinion is just based on some testimony by Officer Sikorsky that the, the video was clearer. But there's nothing to suggest that he didn't mean that it was clear enough from the video, which which counsel has provided, which defense counsel has provided, what is going on. And, and you can see the various officers, and it is possible, even though it's not the clearest video, because it's through a door and it's at 4 a.m., right, it, that it, 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 you can see enough for the officer who was there to identify the, the various uh, players in, in, in the incident. So I don't actually think that this court can make a finding that the, that the video that, that has is not the same video. If the video that we have is the video that was in evidence, I don't think that the officer could have testified as to the identity of the various officers. It is just impossible to answer, to determine who anybody was in the copy of the video that we saw. So I, I'm, well, I'm troubled by what you're telling us, but if you don't have the other video, then we will have to make our own determination. But I gather a search has been made and you couldn't locate it. Is that right? That is absolutely true. We have asked our records department. We've asked them multiple times. We've been trying for months. They have not been able to find it. And, you know, there is a, a <laughs> pandemic situation, which I don't want to blame everything on, on, on COVID-19. But there is a pandemic situation. We have tried multiple times. And I do apologize on behalf of the office for the fact that we have not been able to, to locate the file. But we have not not been. We have no reason to believe that the video in defense counsel's possession is not the actual exhibit that was introduced at trial. And, and I will say that I think that the officer who was there at the scene can look at the video and from recollection, remember who was standing there, who was standing there, uh, et cetera. I, 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 to a lay person who was involved in the incident, I agree that it was that would be difficult. But for the officer who was there, I think it's reasonable to infer that the officer who was there could remember who was who in the video. It, Mr. Cohen, if you if you have uh, if you could just uh, like take one more minute, if any other points you feel you want to just at least raise for our consideration uh, at this point, like the CCRB yes. question. Yes, Your Honor, and, and I would urge uh, the court to to read our, our our brief carefully, and I'm sure you have about the justification issue, because I think the key is that the push was just a mild use of force as the trial judge found. And to say that the defendant had the right to uh, wave his hands and kick and uh, swing a metal handcuff on one hand at the officers in response to that push, which was only because he did not comply with the order to turn around and face the wall, to say that he had the right to assault and injure an officer, significantly enough, he had to miss a month of work and have surgery based on that one push, is not what the legislature had in mind when it enacted Penal Law 3527. Uh, turning to the CCRB issue, I think there are a couple of, it, of, of issues here. Well, you got a and, minute, so. <laughs> yes, okay. and, and, and I will do my best. Uh, okay. I, I'd like to address Rouse first, because counsel addressed the Court of Appeals decision in Rouse. Rouse is a completely different decision. Actually, counsel conflates a couple of different issues that were going on in the trial court. First, it was the question of whether the defendant was allowed, uh, the defense counsel was allowed to cross-examine Lieutenant Rule about whether the CCRB complaint relating to, uh, to, to uh, Mr. Day had been substantiated. And our argument in response to that is that if you look at the way the CCRB is set up, it's much like a grand jury. It's not a trial adjudication. It's much like a grand jury indictment where there's a preliminary ex parte proceeding at, at which an investigation is done. And the Court of Appeals, had, it, but, no, but there's no due process right for the accused officer at that point. Yes, he can have a lawyer, but he can't even see the investigator's report. He, he doesn't have the right to see the evidence against him. It's not adversarial proceeding, and there's no finding made. The only thing the CCRB can do is substantiate the complaint, say there's enough evidence for this to go to a full hearing before an assistant deputy commissioner. In, well, let me just is, talk to you, counsel, and ask you, why isn't that worthy to put in front of the jury? Why is it, why should we ignore it? Why did the trial judge say, no, don't do that? Why is not that finding worthy to go in front of the jury? It's clearly relevant. It's based on testimony. 
And why not put it in front of the jury? What, uh, what other, what justification for not doing that is there? Your Honor, for the same reason that the Court of Appeals has said in the Court of Appeals cases is, is, is cited in our brief, uh, in People v. Miller, 91 New York 2nd, 372, that the fact of an indictment is not something that is proper fodder for cross-examination. An indictment is you have people testifying under oath in a formalized grand jury proceeding that's a court-related setting. The CCRB is not a court. There, there is no sworn officer of the court in, in, in the CCRB proceeding. It's ex parte like a grand jury, but it doesn't, there, there are is not, no even oath requirements. There's no hearsay rule that applies, unlike a grand jury where there's a hearsay rule. Right? So the, the CCRB proceeding is, is certainly, no, has, in our view, has no more weight than a grand jury indictment. Exactly, and the court that appeals, goes to the weight, but not the admissibility, right? That's perfectly fine to cross-examine on all those points, but why not put something relevant like that in front of the jury, particularly in a case that has to do with justification and yeah. accessibility? Well, yeah, I'm sorry, Your Honor. Um, in People v. Miller, the Court of Appeals said that the fact of a grand jury indictment is not something that can get before a jury. You can, the, that a witness cannot be cross-examined about the fact of a, a grand jury indictment. So if a CCRB finding is similar to a grand jury indictment, then the same rule should apply to both. Well, counsel, I don't know if I agree that it's the same because a grand jury indictment is just, uh, you know, is what happens to the grand jury. This has already had some uh uh, background before it gets to where it is. But we will look, we, I've given you a lot of extra time, but they were very interesting issues. We will look uh, over your briefs and of course the cases that you've cited. So I thank you very much. Uh, counsel, uh, can I just give you two minutes for rebuttal, please? And thank you, Mr. Cohn. Thank you. Your yes, Your Honor. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to touch on a couple of mistakes that my adversary made. Uh, first off, CCRB is not an ex parte hearing. Uh, they do have, they are represented by counsel. They can make statements. Uh, second off, he goes to great lengths to try to associate this with a grand jury hearing, but let's talk about what it actually was in Rouse, because in Rouse, what they permitted was they permitted a federal judge who made a finding in an evidentiary hearing. Essentially, there was no jury that charged those officers in Rouse. There was no jury that convicted them. Uh, I don't think that there's no reason that a witness in an evidentiary hearing would have all these ex parte rights either. Uh, the reality is he's working as hard as he can to try to make what happened in Rouse seem different from this, but it's just not that different. Really, the only thing you can point to is that one is administrative and one is judicial. There well, I mean, what, what, judge, yes, what judge Scarpula, I think, said is, uh, you know, there it may not affect the admissibility. Certainly, it may affect the weight, and there can be cross-examination. I mean, what happened with the federal court, what happened in his uh, grand jury, what happened in the CCRB, they're all somewhat different. They're all a little bit different. But are we saying only this is good and not this, or do we allow it admitted and then deal with it uh, in that respect? Mm -hmm. So those are mm -hmm. issues we have to take a look at. Absolutely. And it's slightly worse than that, unfortunately, because in this case, actually, uh, Officer Rule was permitted to call Julian Day a liar on the stand. He said Julian Day lied. Meanwhile, defense counsel, while he's asking that question, knows that the CCRB found by a preponderance of the evidence that Julian Day was telling the truth. And therefore, that when Lieutenant Rule had said that he wasn't telling the truth, that he had lied. And the defense counsel was not allowed to bring that out. So Rule is allowed to sit there and call Julian Day a liar. And that's relevant and that's admissible. But for defense counsel to say, wait a minute, there's a three body panel who only does this, who found that, in fact, Julian Day told the truth. What do you have to say about that? particularly in a case that rests almost entirely on whether that specific officer has a propensity for violence and excessive force. Um, I just, it strains credulity to imagine how that could not be relevant information. And keep in mind, the reason the trial judge gave was, well, you have so much to work with already. I posit that if I have found that there's some evidence of misconduct, that makes it all the more relevant that I look a little deeper and see what might be under the surface. So uh, your honors, I think I would like, what? yes, please. Uh, no, I was going to say, does anyone else have any further questions? I was just curious whether there was any case law that supported the theory that, that in fact, you already had plenty to work with was a basis for excluding the CCRB document. 
I have certainly not found that. And if you ask me, it flies directly in the face of common sense. If I have an officer that I'm accusing of beating my client and I see, well, there's something that indicates that he's done this before for the judge to say, oh, well, the fact that you have an indication means you don't need more. No, that exactly means that I need more. That means I need to chase that indication down and find facts to bring to the jury because it's relevant. And if there's issues with it, then as Judge Darfula said, that should go to the weight. This is clearly relevant. It denied Jonathan Banyan's right under the Sixth Amendment Confrontation Clause. All right. Well, thank you both very much. It gave you a little extra time. It's very interesting. Mr. Rushing, you're a Columbia Law student still? or you're? I've at- actually graduated since then. I was, oh, well, uh, I, I was admitted last year, but thank you well, very much. Well, congratulations. We thank you for your work. Excellent arguments on both sides. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll certainly thank you very take much, this Your further. Take care. Okay. Have a nice day. And uh, the next case that's being argued is um, S. Children. And the only argument is Ms. Llewellyn on behalf of the respondent, Josephina S. Yes. Good morning, Your Honors. And may it please the court. My name is Brittany Llewellyn, and I'm counsel for respondent, Josephina. Your Honors, the record here amply supports that Josefina completed the agency service plan and worked diligently to progress in her parenting. As the family court correctly held here, the agency failed to show by clear and convincing evidence that Josefina did not plan for her children's future. Further, the agency did not make the required diligent efforts that would have supported Josefina's progress toward reunification. Josefina does not contest that the agency created and implemented a service plan in this case. But as the family court recognized, the agency failed to tailor that service plan to Josephina's specific needs as a parent with an intellectual disability. Counsel, example, that's the part that's the part that really struck me, the part that concerned me. So here we have a situation where the caseworker does not have any training to deal with a client who has special needs. In other words, the um, the mother here um, has intellectual uh, limitations and she has very little knowledge of what OW, and let me get the direct, the OPWDD uh, provides by way of services and the agency did not bring in an expert to assist this caseworker. So what does that, what does that mean in your view? Yes, Your Honor. I think you touched on two clear examples in the record of the agency failing to tailor its service plan to Josefina's specific needs. This is a very individualized case-by-case inquiry. And here, Your Honor, fundamentally, the agency has to identify the parent's functional limitations and implement a service program that addresses or is geared towards those limitations in order that the agency's efforts towards reunification won't be futile. And here, Your Honor, as the agency caseworker testified, she did not have experience um, with working with parents with intellectual disabilities, and the agency didn't involve anyone with that knowledge or experience. And Your Honor, you also touched on sort of the agency's failure to take advantage of resources that were available and were recommended. And a psychological evaluation of Josephina specifically recommended day habilitation services, which are off- offered by OPWDD but the agency failed to make referrals to those services and the agency caseworker testified that she didn't even look into the recommended day habilitation services. And why those particular services are relevant to the facts of this case is that the services are designed to help people with parent or people with developmental disabilities with day-to-day living skills such as travel, communication and self-advocacy. And such services would have helped Josephina in her ability to live independently thereby improving her parenting skills. Your Honor, I think it's further reinforced how important this is in this case because the agency criticizes Josephina's punctuality for visits and cites issues around travel and time management as barriers to reunification. But the agency is faulting Josephina for failures it failed to address with its service plan. Josephina's disability impacts her reading and analytical skills, especially as it relates to public transportation, and more tailored support related to time and travel management would have addressed the concerns that were raised by the agency but, and would have been adapted to Josephina's needs. But the mother here was compliant with other requirements, was she not? Yes, Your Honor. Um, she, she took Joseph- she took part in, in, uh, in training and counseling and parenting assistance. So could you address that? Yes, Your Honor. Um, As the family court recognized, Josefina both complied with the service plan 
and she made progress in her parenting abilities. Um, I'd refer back to the testimony by the therapeutic visitation coach and the dyadic therapist who established that Josephina made improvements in her per parenting abilities and monitored the children's safety during her interactions with them. And specifically, the therapeutic visitation coach testified that Josephina was motivated to learn. She was open to constructive criticism. She showed week by week improvement in her ability to manage the children's um, manage the children during sessions. And the therapist testified that she did not have safety concerns during her sessions with Josephina and her children, and that Josephina progressed in her understanding of her children and their disabilities. So, Your Honor, this is clearly a situation in which Josephina completed the service plan. She maintained a close and loving bond with her children through the years of separation. She progressed in her parenting abilities, and the testimony of these two specialists contradicted the agency caseworker's view of Josephina's parenting capacity. And one quick point I want to make there, Your Honor, is that the agency caseworker in this case asserted unjustified and unsupported concerns about Josephina's safety that the family court found were overblown and that appellant itself acknowledges in its opening brief were arguably overstated. But the result of those unjustified and unsupported safety concerns is that Josephina was not permitted unsupervised time with Claudia and with Xavier before the agency um, moved or filed a petition to terminate parental rights. And Your Honor, Josephina should have had that unsupervised time to demonstrate that she could safely care for her children unsupervised before the agency terminated parental rights. So I just wanted to flag that as another failure of the agency in this case. Do, do any of the, uh, any of the uh, judges have any further questions? Um, Ms. Llewellyn, I believe you're doing this pro bono, uh, is that correct? And, yes, Your Honor. Uh, we want to thank you for your time and please thank uh, the partners at Wilmer Cutler Pickering Hale and Door for allowing you to do this work. Thank you very much for your argument today and have a nice day. Thank you very much, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Um, the next case to be argued is Epi versus Heracles Farms. I'm not going to try to pronounce either of the attorney's names, but uh, the case was tough enough. Okay, so you each have five minutes. Um, the uh, Heracles Far Farms, I believe, is the appellant. So we'll hear from you, counsel. That's right. Thank you, Your Honor. This is Ty Dooley for defendant appellant Heracles Farm. If I could reserve one of my five minutes for rebuttal, I'd, I'd appreciate that. Uh, Respond. Okay. All right. So then have a, an appearance. Um, so I'd like to get straight to uh, two of the fundamental reasons why I think the trial court aired here. Uh, the first is that my client, Heracles Farms LLC, no longer exists. It's a dissolved LLC which cannot sue or be sued in New York without a successful nullification of its certificate of cancellation, which has not occurred here. Uh, the certificate of cancellation is reflected on page 75 of the record. It's dated April 19th, 2017 over six months before this action was filed. So under section 18803 of the Delaware LLC Act, in order to sue an LLC that has already filed a certificate like Heracles Farms, the plaintiff must first or, or concomitantly successfully nullify that certificate. This is explained by the Delaware Chancery Court in Metro Communications, a case cited in our briefs, but not addressed uh, by the plaintiff. What it looks like has happened here is Mr. Epi has misconstrued Delaware law by confusing the Delaware Corporations Act with the Delaware LLC Act, but they're completely separate chapters of the Delaware Code. My client's an LLC and they have there's, there's different procedures for winding down. So while a corporation under the Delaware Corporations Act, there is a three-year period for filing suits against it. There's no such provision for an LLC. Instead, that has to happen between dissolution and cancellation. This is described in uh, the Chancery Court's decision in Triple H Family Limited Partnership, which is in our reply. So that's fundamental error number one. I think it's dispositive here, uh, but fundamental error two is somewhat related. Uh, and that's that even if Heracles Farms LLC, my client could be sued as a general matter, it's not the proper party here for a domestication action because it was not a party to the Cameroonian judgment that the plaintiff seeks to have domesticated here. Uh, Article 53 does require in a domestication action that the foreign judgment be, quote, conclusive between the parties. 
Heracles Farms LLC, again, was not a party to that judgment. The party to that judgment was SGSOC, SG Sustainable Oils Cameroon, which is a, a distant affiliate of Heracles Farms LLC. Uh, I, I think the record is fairly conclusive on this point. Uh, the only competent evidence is the affidavit of SGSOC's uh, Cameroonian at attorney who attested that Heracles Farms LLC was not the party in that Cameroonian action and that it doesn't even exist as a legal entity. But doesn't, doesn't the caption of the judgment that was issued in Cameroon list Heracles Farms as a defendant in this case? Yes. In this Heracles, case, I mean? Heracles Farms. Uh, but as Mr. Akko, the Cameroonian attorney, attested in his affidavit, that is the trade name used by SGSOC. Heracles Not Farm. the LLC is Exactly. It's a separate legal entity. Um, in any event, though, Your Honor, even if there was some doubt about this, it, it has to be resolved in our favor as the non-moving party on summary judgment below. Uh, there's, there's not any conflicting affidavit from a, a Cameroonian attorney suggesting that uh, Heracles LLC was the party. But again, this is at most a factual issue. And therefore, it was uh, improper for the, the trial court to, to grant summary judgment against us. There are several other reasons that we've identified in our in our briefs, but I, I really think those two are the fundamental ones that I'd rest on for now. And I'd like to reserve any time I might have for rebuttal. Certainly, uh, you can reserve that one minute for a rebuttal. That would be Thank fine. You. You're welcome. Uh, may I hear from our respondent, Epi? Yes, uh, good morning, uh, Your Honor. Thank you for uh, hearing me today. This is Marwan Sahuel for the uh, plaintiff uh, respondent. So I will respond to um, my adversary's points one by one. Um, first, uh, the first issue raised by my adversary was that under the Delaware LLC Act, a LLC cannot be sued um, after it has filed a uh, certificate of dissolution. Um, I wanna point out two things. One, the uh, entity here was sued in 2013 in Cameroon. We are merely seeking to domesticate a judgment under uh, the CPLR Article 53. Yeah, but, um, but I mean, I don't think that that matters. Judge well, Gesmer, I think you might be muted. I'm sorry? Judge we can't hear you, Judge Gesmer. Okay, but... Oh. Even if that's true, the problem is that the LLC was not actually sued in the Cameroonian action. It was the Heracles Farms was named, but Heracles Farms LLC was not named. And therefore, you didn't sue the LLC in the Cameroonian action. Are you? Yeah, well, well, Your Honor, we think that um, the evidence and the, the most convincing evidence here is the judgment itself. Uh, the judgment itself lists Heracles Farms as the defendant. Uh, in the affidavit submitted by my client, he states that uh, he but sued what about, his employer. Is it Heracles Farms or Heracles Farms LLC? Because there is the, a the caption says Heracles Farms, but the the uh, appellant has not produced any evidence that this was a trade name. They've asserted this. It's a self-serving uh, assertion. There's no evidence of a, an assumed name, a DBA, or any other. Um, uh, procedure by which the the uh, Heracles uh, SGSOC would have assumed Heracles Farms as Mr. an operating While, Mr. Sethwile, yes. don't you agree that there's a difference between an entity and an entity that's an LLC? I Aren't do absolutely different? agree. But so, um, so if the if if the entity that's an LLC isn't named in the complaint, what difference does the judgment made that make where the judgment all of a sudden named somebody who was never a party, who never had a chance to participate, who never agreed to the jurisdiction of the court. How do we get around that? Well, if, if you look at the Cameroonian judgment and you look at the judgment of the trial court, they address each of those issues. Heracles Farms appeared in the Cameroonian action, defended itself, and in fact filed a counterclaim against so my client. Stop one, stop one second. Listen to what you just said. Heracles Farms appeared. So, but my question has to do with Heracles Farms LLC, which is different. So did Heracles Farms LLC appeared? Yes. Appeared? Did they concede jurisdiction to the court? Yes, and that is what the Cameroonian court found as well as the trial court below. Uh, and that is what, if you look at the affidavit um, of my client, he alleges that he sued Heracles Farms LLC, his employer. 
May I interrupt you for a second and go back to something you said? You said, if these two parties, if I sued this other party in some other litigation in some other place at some other time, I should import that into this litigation and say that for the purposes of this litigation, the, the, the um, company isn't not canceled. But that's not, this is exactly what happens all the time. There are earlier litigations between parties and then a judgment. I mean, this is not the first time, certainly I haven't, I have, I've had this more than one time. A judgment is entered somewhere else. The, the LLC gets canceled and I have, and I, and almost uniformly, every other court has said, you cannot enter, you cannot enforce that judgment against a canceled organi uh, organization. You have to go back to Delaware where this company was um, uh, formed and, and bring a proceeding to either appoint a trustee or to nullify. It's statutory and it's pretty straightforward. There's not a lot of um, wiggle room here and it's really very straightforward. The fact that there's another case 10 years ago or even five years ago between these two parties doesn't change that statutory scheme. If I may, this is not a plenary action. This is an action under Article 13 to enter a judgment. It doesn't matter whether it's special or plenary. The, you're telling me to import as the fact that these two parties, that these two parties litigated somewhere else while the corporation was extant into this litigation. And I'm not, and I'm saying to you, that's not what the statute says. Uh, Your Honor, uh, so there are only two mandatory grounds for non-recognition of a judgment and neither the, you know, uh, dissolution or non-dissolution of an LLC uh, is listed under CPL, CPLR 5304. Um, so I, I think we have to yeah, but, but, step but, back. Know, before yeah, you ahead. even get there, if you don't have jurisdiction over them pursuant to the statute, I don't see how <laughs> I don't. you don't even get there. Well, ju jurisdiction is one of the uh, mandatory uh, factors for non-recognition. But in this case, both the Cameroonian court and the trial court ruled that they had jurisdiction over Heracles Farms LLC by virtue of its appearance, its non-assertion of a personal jurisdiction defense, and its assertion of a counterclaim. In that other litigation in Cameroon, but not in the litigation here. It can't, you cannot sue a canceled corporation. That's what the law says. We didn't make it up. It's a statutory requirement. Uh, Your Honor, I ask you to look at the statute more closely and to look at our papers. I'm not, you know. Well, we, uh, counsel, we will be happy to do that. I think we got your point in, in both your brief and your argument, and we will look that over. I'm going to just uh, allow the other side to have one minute of rebuttal, as I said. Uh, the appellant? Thank you, Your Honor. Just three quick points. I mean, one, counsel, and, counsel, and I, I, counsel, I have a question. Yes. Does the fact that the Cameroonian litigation began before the LLC was dissolved make any difference? No, I mean, first of all, that Cameroonian litigation was begun against a, a different entity. Uh, but even if it was our client, as, as your honors all noted, this is a separate action. In order to, to have jurisdiction over Heracles Farms LLC here in New York, it has to exist. And, uh, it, you know, it already wound down. Now, if uh, Mr. Epi believed that that process of cancellation was in order to avoid this judgment or something, then that's an argument that he would have to make in a nullification action, either before or along with this action. And there's procedures that, that provide for that, Rob, but it didn't happen here. Um, so no, it, it does not matter at all. Um, and, and so that's really the, the most fundamental point. And the, the only thing I'd like to just stress, and I'll, I won't be long, is this isn't just a technicality. Uh, you know, these parties are actually quite far removed. I was looking at a flow chart today. It's like the great, great granduncle. It's not like a direct parent relationship here. Um, so for all these reasons and those stated in our briefs, we'd ask the court uh, to vacate this judgment and in order that the, the uh, complaint be dismissed. Thank you. Okay. Thank you both very, very much. That was helpful. Have a nice day. Uh, the next case to be argued is uh, People versus Ruddy Arnote. Mr. Unger. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court, I'm Randall Unger, and I represent the defendant in this appeal. Um, I submit that the, that the defendant committed 
uncharged acts of sexual misconduct violated his right to a fair trial. The trial judge's pretrial ruling made it very clear that such evidence was unduly prejudicial and had to be excluded. Then, during the trial, two witnesses blurred out statements that informed the jury that the defendant had a history of committing similar crimes against the complainant. One witness said this is not the first bad thing that he's done with the complainant, and the second witness said uh, when the complainant told her the defendant had just allegedly molested her, uh, quote, that has been going on since she was a child. Now, I understand that a, a trial judge has discretion uh, in declaring a mistrial. I also understand that a mistrial will waste valuable judicial resources and is inconvenient to everyone. But I would submit that inconvenience and delay should not override a defendant's right to a fair trial, the right to be tried for the charges in the indictment and not other uncharged and unproven crimes. Counsel, and what's the problem with the, curatives that, with the curative that was given? Well, of course, the trial judge did what he could in an attempt to undo the damage. I'm saying this is a bell that cannot be unrung. In a case like this, where the sole evidence against the defendant is the complainant's testimony, which, according to her, happened on that particular day and no other day, now you have two other witnesses who basically are telling the jury, he's been doing it for years, the same thing, and everybody lets him get away with it. You can't undo that damage. I mean, I, I, I think in my reply brief, I, I cited an old federal case uh, with a very colorful expression. You, uh, you can't throw a skunk into the jury box and then instruct the jury not to smell it. That's what we have here, a horrible smell that arose when these two witnesses, in clear violation of the trial judge's pretrial ruling, informed the jury he's been doing it to this poor young girl for years. And there's no way, after hearing that testimony, the defendant can get what I think he's entitled to, a, a due process right to a fair trial. And I think um, the trial judge, look, I understand he didn't want to declare a mistrial. It's uh, a nuisance and, for and everybody. He did, he, look, he did give a curative instruction. I understand we've all been trial judges. We know we sometimes tell juries to please disregard this or that that sneaks out. Otherwise, every case I would ever try might have had to be mistried for one reason or another. You hope that the jury uh, anticipate that the jury does follow those rules. And I think that's what the judge was doing here. So he gave a curative and... Uh, well, you know, uh, what you're saying is the jury couldn't separate it. Uh, you know, and I, there, there are kind of two conflicting philosophies involved in this type of uh, error. You have um, the presumption that jurors will follow the court's instructions. We all know that. And then we have court of appeals cases and even a Supreme Court decision where it was said that we all know, every trial lawyer knows that it's an unmitigated fiction that a juror is just going to disregard something that damaging and prejudicial to just strike it from their minds. It's impossible. Um, and uh, there was one other uh, small point that I think um, needed to be addressed. The trial judge, in denying the mistrial, seemed to be very forgiving to these two uh, witnesses who blurted these statements out. Uh, he made reference to the idea that it's, it, English was not their native language and we have to kind of forgive them for their enthusiasm, I suppose. Uh, I don't think that's an appropriate way to view this, this problem. There's one, there should be one standard for adult witnesses, and um, that should be adhered to by all witnesses. Now, and another point, given the pretrial ruling, one would expect that the prosecutor who was trying this case would have very carefully prepared her witnesses and cautioned them, please, I, I know you've told me that uh, this defendant allegedly did things before to this girl, but please uh, don't cause a problem by bringing these things into this courtroom. So I'm assuming that they were prepared and told don't make any references to that. So uh, with that assumption, then we can conclude that these witnesses purposely, intentionally blurted out these things for the sole purpose of injuring 
and prejudicing the defendant. Um, I have a large leap to make. Even if, I mean, even if the prosecutor prepared them, I think people are often very nervous as witnesses and to assume that they said this intentionally and purposely is a, seems to me a very large jump. I mean, well, given the observation of witnesses in a courtroom, it's a very scary thing to do and people don't remember every instruction they're given. And, and, and I've tried a number of cases myself, and basis. I know... I'm, I'm just wondering the basis for your claim that this was intentional and purposeful by these witnesses. Let's look at the context here. After the first witness blurts out that statement, then uh, I'm sure the prosecutor even more vigorously instructed her other witnesses, stay away from that... I'm sorry, one moment. I'm very sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry. I apologize. Yeah. I'm sure that the prosecutor for the next several witnesses cautioned them even more vigorously. Don't bring out anything that happened in the past. We're focusing on one day only. And still that witness blurted it out. And that was on direct examination. The first time it happened was during the defense counsel's cross-examination. So I, I don't think it's such a jump to make the assumption or, or, or infer that at least the second witness was doing it on purpose, having been told to stay away from the subject. Uh, I believe- can, can you just wrap it up for now? You have two minutes of rebuttal because yes. um, we've taken I think our also time. The defendant's right to a fair trial was also violated by the prosecutor's summation remarks. Um, certainly the prosecutor was entitled to respond to the defense arguments in summation but she had to respond fairly. She didn't do that. She vouched excessively for the credibility of her witnesses. She appealed to the sympathy of the jurors, uh, asking them to feel sympathy for the complainant, having to be put through the uh, process of having to testify in court, uh, calling her courageous and brave. Um, and the worst comment, I think, was that she suggested that the incident between the defendant and the complainant was quick, because maybe he was testing the waters that day. That, to me, was a clear suggestion to the jury that he was intending to commit further and more egregious crimes against the complaining witness. For all of these reasons, I would ask that the conviction be reversed and a new trial ordered. Thank you, Mr. Unger. Uh, may I hear from the respondent? May it please the court, Victoria Muth for the people. Uh, starting with the Molyneux issue, neither comment was so prejudicial as to warrant the drastic remedy of a mistrial. Both comments at issue did not specify any of defendant's prior conduct, and I would like to take both comments in turn. Starting with Delia's testimony, defense counsel asked her on cross-examination about her relationship with her sister, and Delia had replied that she did not have a relationship with her sister anymore because her sister was quote, accepting of the bad things that defendant had done in the past. After the, te the witness um, testified as such, defense counsel asked a mitigating follow-up question, asking her if she had instructed either of her sisters to not let defendant be um, with the victim, and she said no. The court prop properly found that that follow-up question mitigated any inference that the jury may have had that uh, there was some type of pattern of sexual abuse, and defense counsel declined any curative instruction. After that, uh, Maybe was asked on direct examination whether she had told the, wit the victim that she was going to go back inside and tell people what the victim had said, and she said no because the cousin would get very angry because this was not the first time this has happened. Again, there was no... Um, specific reference to any type of prior sexual misconduct at all. And um, and the court did issue a prompt and effective curative instruction and had that stricken from the record. And that was the appropriate remedy here as opposed to a mistrial for a number of reasons. The first one being that everybody took reasonable measures to ensure that evidence of the uncharged conduct did not reach the jury. Defense counsel did not doubt that Ms. the prosecutor... I think your adversary's um, argument is that, yes, but that wasn't enough. Um, it was enough because, uh, one, as the trial judge, I think, correctly found, um, 
given that all of the parties had done everything that they could to keep this information from the jury, there was a like very strong likelihood that even if the case were to be tried all over again, it was likely that this information could still come out inadvertently. The prosecutor had done what she could to instruct the witnesses not to say this. But the reality of the situation is that there was a language barrier. It's safe to assume that they probably were very nervous. And the um, you know, all of the events from the past were intertwined in their minds as well. Um, given that. So as I think this through, I kind of think of, of two parts to this, right? One, um, was the curative enough? Was the courts, were the court's instructions enough? And then the second part, which is very different, which kind of comes from a trial court perspective, trial judge's perspective is, doesn't the trial judge have a relationship with every jury so as to discern whether they are listening or not listening, following or not following instructions and does that have does that play a role in in all of this that we are discussing here on this appeal? To address your first question, the curative instruction was enough for the reasons that I stated that the comments were not so prejudicial as to warrant um, a mistrial. They were ambiguous and the parties had done what they could to keep this from the jury. As for the second part of your question, the the trial judge has the discretion for a reason to decide whether such a drastic remedy is the appropriate action to take. And I think given that Justice Klott, um, you know, does have that kind of relationship with the jury and is able to see the courtroom proceedings in a way that we are not, uh, deference should be given to the discretion that he exercised in deciding that this was the appropriate action. The jury was presumed to follow that instruction and um, and that was effective. Um, turning to defense counsel's challenge to the people's summation, um, all of his current challenges are unpreserved because he made no objections to any of the comments below. But regardless, all of the comments that the prosecutor made were fair comments on the evidence and responsive to defense counsel's own summation. So unless there are any questions from the bench, um, the judgment of conviction should be affirmed. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Mr. Unger, you have two minutes for rebuttal. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. First, I, I strongly disagree with the people's assessment of the blurted out statements. Uh, I don't think they were ambiguous at all. Uh, in the context in which they were given to the jury, I don't think the jury had any difficulty understanding what they were getting at. These were obviously uh, statements that the defendant had previously sexually molested the complaining witness. Uh, the, the people have not even presented any possible alternative explanation as to what the witnesses were trying to communicate. Uh, so I, I disagree. I think the jury got it. And they got it twice from two different witnesses, both saying the same thing. He's done it before, and that means... He's got a propensity, and especially in a case involving a child with sexual allegations. You know, we know from literature that um, uh, people who are um, pedophiles who engage in this type of behavior, um, they can't stop it. And that's that's a real, uh, that's a reality. And people know this, and they've heard it. And when the jury hears this, they say, oh, okay, this is consistent. What happened that day wasn't out of the blue, it wasn't an isolated occurrence, he's done it before. Then you couple that with the prosecutor's summation statement that he was maybe testing the waters that day. So now the prosecutor's getting from two witnesses, he's done it before, and she's insinuating he'll do it again. I don't see how you could even imagine more prejudice and damage to the defendant's right to a fair trial. I would submit that he's entitled to a reversal for these errors, and I thank the court. Thank you both very much uh, for your arguments. We will take a look at this and uh, have a nice day. Thank you. Uh, the next case to be argued is Freed versus Amberg. Uh, yes, Your Honor. Uh, may it please the court, Shai Silverman on behalf of petitioner appellant Richard Freed. Your Honors, I think to understand what's at issue in this case, it's important to take a step back and look at the broader statutory landscape of pre-objection discovery with respect to estates in New York, because the provision at issue here, 21021, is one of a number of statutes 
that's designed to empower someone like Mr. Freed, who has a potential objection to an estate matter, to get the information they need to determine whether to bring the objection before bringing it. That's true in the will contest under uh, will uh, will context under 1404. It's true with respect to an accounting under 2211, and we sus uh, submit that it's true with respect to revocable Ms. trusts. Mr. Silverman, but isn't your first hurdle the question of standing, since the the um, plaintiff didn't have an interest in the decedent's estate and well, yes, Your Honor. So, the trust? Well, so that, yes, Your Honor, and that's, that's the point I'm trying to get at. So for, to answer the question, consider what this case would look like if there were no revocable trust. And instead, Mr. Freed was just trying to contemplate an objection to Ms. Freed's will. Yeah, but, There's but, no there, is, but there is. Yes, Your Honor, but, but revocable trusts, Your Honor, have been called equivalent in the eyes of the law to a will under matter of Davidson. And that's because they achieve the same purpose. They're it's, not the same. The statute only applies in probate. And since there's nothing to be probated, because a revocable trust doesn't have to be probated, the statute by its terms doesn't apply. I just don't understand why your client just didn't use the, his remedies under the CPLR rather than continuing to pursue this where he doesn't have standing to do so. Well, Your Honor, obviously we, we disagree and think he does have standing and we think that the estate... Why wouldn't you just pursue the CPLR remedy rather than bringing it up here to fight? Why wouldn't you just go? To well, so, so Your Honor, in, in fact, um, one thing we did do is after this decision um, and after hearing that this was the wrong vehicle in the mind of the surrogate, um, we went to uh, to uh, in November of 2019, so nearly a year ago, uh, sought limited letters of administration under 7029 to get this information. A citation hasn't even been issued in that case yet. Um, and that really, this lived experience really illustrates the point that we're trying to make here, which is the whole point of 2102 is to get this information quickly uh, and before you have to make any formal, uh, to raise any formal objection or to bring any formal litigation. That's part and parcel of this broader landscape um, of pre-objection uh, discovery in a, in, in a state law. And, and again, your honors, again, think about if this was a will, there's no doubt that he would have standing under 1404. So, and May I interrupt you for a second, please? It was that argument might be more resonate better if you didn't have a remedy, but you have a remedy. The statute says what it says, and you have a remedy under another statute. So why are you asking us to stretch this statute in a way to shoehorn your your particular facts in when they don't? Go, they don't, they're not covered by the statute. As Justice Gesmer said, why not just use the remedy you have? You can get pre-action discovery pretty quickly under the CPLR. I, and in fact, you're supposed to bring that motion by an order to show cause. So why not just do what the statutes require you to do rather than ask us to shoehorn you in under a hugely broad interpretation of a pretty straightforward statute? Sure, Your Honor. So, of course, we, we disagree with, with uh, that interpretation of the statute, uh, and I'll get to that in a moment, of course, but, oh, but just sure. because they're... Why do you disagree with that interpretation? Let's start with that. Because, so so let's turn to the, to the language of the statute. So the, the language on its face allows Mr. Freed to request information concerning the assets or heirs of an estate. And again, estate is not equivalent to probate estate, contrary to the opposition's uh, uh, position. The, SC, the SCPA defines estate to include something like this trust relevant to the interest of the petitioner. And the, the interest of the petitioner, if we want to understand That's what that so means. broad and fuzzy. What do you, where do you find what you are talking about covered in this statute? Well, again, Your Honor, I, 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 I'm not sure I see what, what's broad and fuzzy uh, in, your, in your view on this front, but, but, but again, the estate, the estate just means the estate. It doesn't mean the probate estate. It could mean the taxable estate, for example. After all, stuff in a revocable trust is still taxed under, his, under but, the estate. But, counsel, so, this is a, the, this, the language of this revocable trust clearly says that the plaintiff has no standing. It clearly says that the grantor has made no provision for her son, Richard Freed, because he is adequately cared for by gifts and bequests made outside of this trust and his other assets. So the lang it's, it's not as if we're not sure or we're unclear as to whether maybe he has an interest. The, the language of the revocable trust says, this particular child of mine has no interest here. And I understand that 
that this may be like a very difficult situation for a child to to experience, but the language says what it says and you're proceeding under this particular statute and do you really leave us any options? So again, Your Honor, I, there's no dispute that he is disinherited from those assets by this by this instrument or that it purports I, to be I, that. I didn't use uh, that tough word. I didn't use that tough word. But so I'm, I'm not, there's no, there's no dispute that that's what this instrument purports to do. But the question is whether he has standing to figure out why and how his mother did that. And what we're saying is that 2102 gives him that right. And again, I, I, it's important to note that this isn't an isolation. This is part of a broader public policy that New York has with respect to a state law to allow people like Mr. Freed to get the information they need quickly. And, and again, I, I, revocable trust is a substitute will. That's the language that case after case have used to describe it. The Tisdale case, the Getz case, the Allen case. They're to be treated as equivalent under the eyes of the law. That's but in, in, this, in this particular case, didn't the uh, decedent go on to say that in the event for any reason the trust, w this trust would be invalidated, the will provides for the very same distribution of assets as in the trust. So he's just not a beneficiary. I mean, she, uh, it sounds like the decedent thought through all these different possibilities to protect the validity or, uh, you, you know, of, of the of the instrument that she created. So, you know, she mentioned him as being a, 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 a someone who, uh, her son, as <clears throat> getting money from other situations and that if there was any invalidate, invalidating of the trust, the will would follow the same way. So she sort of covered all the bases. Well, Your Honor, in my view, that actually only further supports the point, because, again, if there was no revocable trust and we were dealing with that will, there is no dispute that Mr. Freed would have standing to get exactly the documents he's requesting here. It's only by virtue of the transfer to the revocable trust that these rights are purportedly extinguished. And we're saying that there's nothing in the case law and there's nothing in the statute that suggests that. But, Your Honor, if I may. OK, just finish up because you've got you've. Yes, if I may, I, I see that my time's expiring. So I wanted to just make one further point, right. because it's not just that the surrogate court's decision undermines this policy of efficiency that underlies this whole statutory regime here. It's that it affirmatively creates a perverse incentive. And, and we mentioned this in our brief and the opposition never responded to it because forget the Freed sisters and forget this case for a moment. Imagine there was someone who really did want to manipulate their parents into, uh, into disinheriting a sibling to their own benefit. They would have every incentive to transfer the assets into the revocable trust because they could insulate themselves from early discovery. In fact, they may never be exposed. So we think this is going to work out long, Your Honor, and, and we, we request that you, that you reverse. All right, uh, do you want to ask another question now? Jack I just Scarborough. want to say that's my whole point. They're not insulated. They have a remedy. It's just not the remedy you've used. It's not the remedy under the statute that you've cited. There's no way they're insulated. They can get the same discovery, but under a different statute. That's really, I think, is the, the flaw. Here. Okay. okay. Anyway, why, don't, you. Why, don't you, why don't you respond to that in your rebuttal, okay? Thank you, Your Honor. Will do. Can I, thank you very much. Can I hear from the respondent, please? Uh, absolutely, Judge. My name is John Morkin. Uh, first of all, let me ask whether you can hear me and see me. Okay, yes. great, great, excellent. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to to, to address you. I'm uh, here on behalf of Amy Freed, uh, the fiduciary, the trustee, and her two sisters who are beneficiaries. They're not actually fiduciaries. Um, I very much appreciate the comment about other re uh, remedies. Surrogate Anderson pointed that out. The case cited and referred to immediately uh, a moment ago by Mr. Silverman, matter of Davidson, decided by Judge Reney Roth, that addresses the, the uh, subject of revocable, revocable trust, talks about the right to bring an action to set aside a trust individually, and also to obtain limited letters to bring a proceeding under 2103 to set aside the trust. Interestingly enough, this choice made by the plaintiff here, or petitioner, I should say, was deliberate. And I say that because I'm looking at the affirmation uh, of Mr. Kenny, one of uh, petitioner's counsel, uh, dated September 17, 2015, in support of the petition, where he states, paragraph three, and it's at the, in the record at page 22, Mr. Freed has standing to bring the petition based on this court's decision in matter of Davidson, 
a true and correct copy of which is attached here to his exhibit A. In Davidson, this court held that a disinherited distributee can initiate a SCPA 2102 subdivision one proceeding without first obtaining limited letters of administration. That is not the case. If you look at Davidson, Davidson, Judge Rip Ross said in Davidson that you would have standing if you are disinherited as a distributee in your own right individually to bring such an action or proceeding, but also you can obtain limited letters for that purpose to bring a proceeding under 2103. 2102, which is what we're talking about here, was never referenced. The And this is why the, Judge Anderson in her decision said, although petitioner alleges he seeks information to determine whether the decedent validly created the trust, SCAPA 2102 subdivision one is not the proper vehicle. The proper vehicle, of course, is get limited letters. He, They chose in 2015, they knew about Davidson, that Davidson was a 2103 proceeding where you get limited letters to do just that. They deliberately chose not to do it. Why, I don't know. Now, there's three trusts here, if you, you recall the record. Uh, under under the dad's will, Bernard, there's a trust uh, that, that, that uh, uh, Richard, uh, the petitioner, is benefited. Under uh, mom herself, Ruth, had a family trust where he's benefited. Uh, then you have this trust. So he's not, quote, disinherited. He certainly receives, in fact, received over half a million dollars. My point on 2102 is simply that if, if uh, Richard Freed wanted to get information as to those two trusts which benefited him, he could use 2102. He can't use that section for the trust in which he has no interest, both by in terms of who is listed as beneficiaries and explicitly, as the trust says, he's not benefited. And the will says he's not benefited in that avenue. So as, as every authority I've ever seen uh, addresses this, you can't do it if you don't have a specific actual interest in that trust. When you talk about the word estate, you have various trust estates. The estate of this trust is the property that's in this trust. Then you have another trust or another probate estate that's under in that. And, you, and you're limited to who the beneficiaries are in that instrument under 2102. So what, what should have uh, uh, petitioner have done? It's very clear. Back in 2015, he should have applied for limited letters and he didn't even need to do that. Under Davidson, he could have done it in his own right individually. He could have brought a proceeding or action to set aside that trust. He did not do so. Now I'm hearing that for the first time, actually, personally, that uh, something was filed finally at the end of 2019. Well, frankly, uh, you know, I, I suspect any delay there may have been occasioned by what we've all been going through, uh, but be that as it may, um, that is the remedy. It's not 2102. That's why this case uh, in the decision by Judge Anderson should be affirmed. With that being said, I have uh, I'll just stand on my brief. Thank thank you very much, Mr. Morgan. Uh, you have a, a minute for rebuttal, uh, Mr. Silverman. Thank you, Your Honor. And and just to, two points to make in rebuttal. The first is just because there are a lot of ways to skin a cat doesn't mean you get to just don't get to decide how you want to skin it. And especially if the one way is more efficient than all the rest. The whole point of 2102, and again, this broader regime is to that somebody doesn't have to go through the process of initiating formal litigation before determining whether or not to raise an objection. And Mr. Freed tried to do that here and was uh, was prevented from doing so. And that's why he's now pursuing uh, the limited letters uh, as opposing counsel discussed. He also he talked a little bit about how Mr. Freed is not disinherited, but that's a little disingenuous because Mr. Freed was an equal recipient um, of the, under these other trusts with his sisters and presumed that was going to be the case for all of the assets. Only no, that's, to not discover at the end of their life. that's not necessarily relevant to whether or not this is the correct, uh, sure, the correct it's, procedure. It's, Sure, it's relevant in the same way that his receipt of those assets, to the extent that those assets are relevant at all. But it's, I, I want to emphasize again that the statute says nothing about standing of someone like Mr. Freed's position. He has an interest because he's been adversely affected by the transfer to the trust. That's how 1404 and 1410 define standing under a will. And we think because they're equivalent, he should be treated the same way with respect to the revocable trust. So we think the surrogate court got it wrong and we respectfully request that we reverse. Thank you, Your Honor. Anybody else have any questions? Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you both very much and have a lovely day. Thank you very much. And, uh, and now the last case to be argued today is People versus Collier. Uh, Mr. Weiner, I believe, for the uh, appellant.
Yes, uh, thank you, Your Honor, and good afternoon. I'm Benjamin Weiner on behalf of the appellant, Kyle Collier. The court below should have granted Mr. Collier's request for substitution of counsel, where all of his numerous and specific complaints about counsel indicated a relationship that had completely broken down, and significantly, defense counsel agreed. Uh, if you look at the through line of all of his complaints, what really lies at the heart of all of them is a failure of counsel and Mr. Collier to communicate adequately. So at uh, the initial request, he specifically says so, he's worried so, counsel has- So Mr. Weiner, are you saying that there were irreconcilable differences? Absolutely, Your Honor. And are you, are you including defense counsel's decision not to have his clients testify before the grand jury? Yes, we're, it's the sum total of all of the things that uh, that Mr. Collier said about counsel. So obviously that decision on its own, that's counsel's decision to make. But it's, right. clear, but it's clear in context and in the context of the other complaints that counsel had a serious difference, not only in terms of strategy, but also in terms of explaining what he was doing to Mr. Collier. Um, I, I think my adversary pointed out in their response brief what he's asking for is to go back and redo the grand jury proceeding. That betrays a, a serious lack of understanding of what the proceedings were all about. And and I would say similarly for his suggestion that counsel wasn't advocating his views at the arraignment. This is not just a difference in strategy. This is counsel failing to explain to him um, what is going to happen in court. And I think when you combine it with the really explicit statements at the, the next request that he can't trust counsel, counsel's not being forthcoming. He's upset about the way counsel is communicating with him about the plea deal, which made it seem like counsel didn't care what happened to him. This was a complete breakdown of this relationship. It wasn't just any one thing. It was a relationship that deteriorated over time. And counsel's statement is really, really significant. Counsel, when he's joining the request, isn't just saying, sure, if Mr. Collier wants a, a new attorney, that's fine with me. What he's saying is, I can't trust Mr. Collier either. I'm being set up as a punching bag for a disciplinary complaint or an ineffective assistance of counsel claim. I feel almost as if Mr. Collier has stabbed me in the back. This is mutual distrust on both sides. This is a real bona fide, genuine conflict that has gone beyond just there's one or two small differences of opinion. And, and I think key is, again, this reference to a disciplinary complaint or an IAC claim. What counsel is saying is my interests are in conflict with Mr. Collier's. They are, if they are in conflict to my continued representation of Mr. Collier. And that was borne out by counsel's response to the first request. Counsel unbidden by the court, counsel hadn't been asked to defend his performance at this point, betrays Mr. Collier's confidences. He explains his confidential strategy and why he decided not to put Mr. Collier on the stand in front of the grand jury. And I think he implies- Wait, Mr. Sorry, Collier, the, the, the statement that indicates betrayal is what? You know why he, I'm not putting him on the stand? Uh, I'm sorry I, if uh, I wasn't totally clear. This is his statement uh, after Mr. Collier's second request uh, for new counsel. It's on page um, 32 of the pretrial, uh, the separately paginated pretrial minutes. Uh, his statement is, I have the sense that I'm being set up as a punching bag. That The prior statement at the arraignment is significant too, because what counsel is doing there is actually putting his own interests ahead of Mr. Collier's. He's trying to avoid exactly what he says later he's worried about, which is a disciplinary complaint or an IAC claim, by divulging his confidential strategy for keeping Mr. Collier off the stand and implying that Mr. Collier would have perjured himself or at the very least made damaging statements in the grand jury. There was no cause to do that. There was certainly no cause to do that that was consistent with Mr. Collier's interests. So when he says later, there's a conflict here, I, I'm worried about these things happening. We know that this was a lawyer who, who felt that very deeply and had acted on it previously. So the court had every indication here. It had absolutely every indication that this was a relationship that had gone south. These were two people who 
both acknowledged they couldn't trust each other, couldn't work with each other. They had tried, they had failed, and there was no reason to think that this relationship was salvageable. And so presented with those circumstances, the court below should have granted this joint request for substitution of counsel. Um, You've used up your time. Do you want to, uh, do, is there any other point that you want to make now or you want to hold it for your rebuttal? I'll hold it for my rebuttal. Thank you. Your Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warner. Uh, Ms. Wang, are you, uh, you have six minutes. Yes, your honors. Good morning. Uh, and may it please the court, Diana Wang for the people. Defendant failed twice to show good cause before two different judges. Now he wants to argue that somehow those two separate requests combined somehow add up to good cause, but two inadequate requests do not add up to a whole one. The first request was made before the arraignment judge and all defendants said there was, he's not exactly fairly comfortable with counsel. And he said he was hoping to go back to the grand jury stage. Now, counsel has said on his argument that sh shows a lack of communication, but I don't know how counsel could have known that defendant is going to request a new lawyer. And the reason he wants a new lawyer is because he thinks if he got a new lawyer, he would be able to go back and relitigate at the grand jury stage. Unless the defendant disclosed all of that to counsel before making the request, I don't see how counsel could have read his mind and explained it to him. Even if you got a new counsel, you can't relitigate at the grand jury stage. Of course, as the court pointed out to defendant correctly, that is within counsel's discretion, not within your discretion. And clearly, that is a strategic judgment. And didn't and didn't that judge um, indicate to the defendant that he would be permitted to renew his request at the next court date if yeah. he still felt that way? Which I think I've read in many transcripts is what the judges do. You know, let let's see what happens next time. If he did not do that, am I correct about that? That's exactly right. It was Justice Minna who said, "If you still feel this way on the next date, you you can come back and I'll give you new counsel." And he appeared before her three more times and then one more time before a different judge. He never said anything at those four subsequent court dates. The next and only time he says something. And counsel, was, if I may, before you say that, and this is someone with a prior felony conviction. So he he had some experience in some way with the grand jury. Is that right? That's that's correct. This is not a stranger to the court, to the system, nor is he very uh, a shy person. He's shown more than once that he's willing to interrupt the court, assert himself, and yet he has not been able to make anything more than generalized complaints. The second and final time he made a request for counsel was notably on the day the trial was supposed to begin. And he goes, well, now I want a new, now I want a new counsel. And again, what he said was, I'm not exactly fairly comfortable with my representation. And when the court asked him to specify what do you really mean by that, and he said, oh, I, I think he's in, he's not uh, telling me what he's talking about with the prosecutor. And the court said, look, sometimes counsel is going to have to tell you tough things that you don't want to hear, such as the people's case is very strong against you. And defendant admitted, oh, my counsel did lay th those things out on the table. He did say those things to me. He's just dis he just didn't ensure my comfortability in doing so. So at that point, the court knew that defendant admitted counsel discharged all of his obligations by telling him, these are your choices. This is the ca people's case against you. It's very strong, but in the end, it's your decision. And the defendant admitted that that's what happened. He just didn't find counsel's way of doing it very soothing or comfortable but of course that's not grounds to that's not grounds to substitute counsel especially not on the eve of trial and finally with respect to counsel's statement that he feels like a punching bag that came at the again on the day of trial and i think it's common that once defendant makes a request for substitution of counsel that's going to create some tension between the client and counsel and there is a long line of case law stating that counsel are permitted to defend their performance if they wanted to. But that's not even what counsel did. 
All counsel said was, I feel like a punching bag. That's a very generalized complaint. It's not specific enough to warrant good cause. It did not betray any confidence of defendant. It did not betray any factual information that is sensitive about the client. And notably, despite what counsel said, he went on to give a very vigorous defense of the client. He got one charge dismissed before trial. He got the top count uh, acquitted at trial. And then at sentencing, counsel was more than willing to fall on his own sword by telling the court, judge, don't blame the defendant for what I said during trial. Uh, the people are arguing that he deserves this big sentence because uh, we blame the cops for planting drugs at his apartment. But the defendant never said that. I was the one who said that. So don't punish my client for something that I did. And that, if that's not zealous and vigorous representation, I don't know what is. And he was quite competent and effective, too, because he did get his client the minimum prison sentence. He also managed, as I said, to get the ammunition charge dismissed at the pretrial motion stage, as well as the top count of uh, intent to sell at trial acquitted. Uh, notably, that's presumably why a defendant does not raise any effective assistance of counsel claim. For um, those reasons, yes, Your Honor. All right. Anybody have any further questions? I guess you would like us to affirm the conviction. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Weiner, you have a minute to rebut. Thank you. Uh, to this point of how is counsel to know that Mr. Collier wants to go back and redo the grand jury proceeding, it's counsel's job to find out. He's supposed to be conferring with his client about the proceedings. He's supposed to be talking to him about what's happening. That is exactly what we're saying is that counsel wasn't communicating effectively with his client and wasn't learning this. That's the point. Um, in terms of the renewal of this request and what Justice Menon said to Mr. Collier, she said, yes, wait, come back, have him file motions on his behalf. And Justice Menon re referenced the next date. She certainly never said, speak then or forever hold your peace. The clear employer of her statement was, Try to get along with counsel. See if you can remedy this situation. And that's what Mr. Collier did. He was trying to comply in good faith with the court's instructions that he reconciled with counselor. And it would be tremendously unfair to decide that that was evidence of his bad faith in trying to delay the trial and making, the new, making a new request. Uh, as to all of this about whether counsel was effective or ineffective, that's really not relevant. Mr. Collier was entitled to an unconflicted lawyer, whether or not his lawyer was going to provide effective assistance ultimately. That prejudice analysis has no place in this kind of case. But you would agree, you would agree that a defendant does not have a right to a counsel of his choice or her choice. No, but at the bare minimum, he has the right to a lawyer that he he can communicate with and where communication has not completely broken down and where there's not mutual distrust on both sides. And that for all of these reasons he cited had been completely destroyed by the time he made his second request. There was no trusting relationship here, and substitution of counsel was the appropriate remedy. Uh, for those reasons, thank you, Your Honor. Okay, thank you. Thank you both, counsel, very much. Uh, this concludes oral arguments for today. Court is now adjourned. Thank you.